My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Counter them, they will not mean so much to you anymore. Imagine for a second that you came into this world at the age of 25 and then you just stood in the world and you looked to the heavens and you saw the clouds. You saw the blue sky and you saw the cloud moving. If you are not careful, you will faint and die. But you see, because you grew up as a child and you began to interact with some of these very strange realities, it became normal to you. So even as an adult, you don't settle down to contemplate the power that holds the foundations of the earth. You don't sit down to contemplate the power that causes the cloud to hover in the heavens, hanging on nothing. Everything that is supposed to be supernatural to you becomes normal because you came up as a child and you were not taught the mysteries that make these things to work. Job was like that, walking with the Lord. It didn't occur to him that the clouds in the heavens, the waters in the, in the river, that kept their boundaries, it didn't occur to him that it was an invisible hand that made things work the way they worked. He never knew that the superlative intelligence that divine designed the patterns in creation was put in place by an invisible force until the plague of his life came to him. And in the midst of crisis and adversity, Job lifted up his voice and began to lament against God. And for the first time, God appeared to him and made him understand that even the creation around him was supposed to inform him of the supernatural dimensions of God. It became normal for Job that the waters were there because the waters wanted to flow in their courses. He thought the cloud was there because it was so. He thought the, the thunder, the lightning, everything was the way they were because they were occurrences in nature. And when God showed up in Job chapter 38 verse 1, he said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this that speaks out of tone because it's obviously bereft of requisite intelligence in interacting with the divine? And in verse 31 of that scripture, God began to ask him questions that inform the borderlines of creation. It's natural that you woke up this morning and you thought you were awake because of biological process. Until the, the Lord appears to you and begins to ask you, by what intelligence are the bones formed in her that is with child? Until God begins to ask you again, by what intelligence does the breath on your nostril, how is it sustained on your nostril? Then for the first time it will turn on you that everything happening around you is supernatural. And that you have been summoned to walk with an invincible spirit that sustains the supernatural stature. An awareness will come to you. And then you will have to, if you are reasonable, contemplate why you were put here. So we wanted to look at the matters of our lives that bordered on purpose. We wanted to look at what life itself was about. But unfortunately, time could not afford us that privilege last night. So tonight, I want to show you some of the heavy molecules that God considers when he deals with humankind. And some of us will realize that these things are not part of our lives. So, but paraventure, we leave this world today and we get to eternity. We will just realize that we didn't appear in the radar of heaven. It's possible that a man will cross from time to eternity and then it will down on him that even though he breathed oxygen for 90 years, he never appeared in the radar of heaven. 
that man would have been a waste of divine supply. Because what you don't realize is that the air on your nostrils, the life that you live, is an investment of divinity. And by the time life and time is accomplished, God will ask questions as touching the things that he has given to you. And every man that fails to maximize those divine investments in his soul will discover that he is a waste as far as the equation of divinity is concerned. And when God comes to judge among men, such people will not have a place with God. This is why we cry every day that by all means our lives will count. Because it's possible to walk through time and your life never counts. That's the greatest affliction of humankind. That a man will walk through time and his life will not count. When you cross to eternity, there is no privilege of redemption. There's no privilege of making amends. There's no privilege of correction. Life is so deadly. <laughs> it's like a scientific research. You see, when you carry out a research, you spend the time, the money, and everything. It's at the end of the research you will find out whether you were correct or not. You would have wasted all the resources. The drugs they produce sometimes take 20 years to get into the market. When you have spent all the billions, and then you get into the market, you now discover that that drug was a poison. Then you have to destroy everything and begin again. A man can cross to eternity, and when everything, mercy, grace has been dispensed on his life, then he realizes that with the provision of grace and mercy, God will say he didn't leave because he didn't appear on the radar of heaven. Kenneth Hagin was a pastor for 13 years. When Jesus appeared to him, Jesus told him, you have taken your first step into your prophetic call. So for 13 years as a pastor, serving the Lord with all his heart, he had not begun to scratch what was written concerning him. What a waste that life would have been if he did not join into the spirit to find out what was written concerning his destiny. Moses lived in Egypt for 40 years. The angels that were writing his story on earth had nothing to write. So the life of a man for 40 years was only in 8 verses. 8 verses of the Bible. 40 years of his life there was nothing to write. And even in those 8 verses of the Bible nothing was written about him. It was the things that happened when he had no consciousness or no participatory ability that were written. For himself, the angels that were writing his story had nothing to write for 40 years. The day the scribe began to write his story was the day the Bible said, and Moses came of age. The day Moses' life began to count was the day Moses began to walk according to the dictates of ordination. Could it be that you have lived for the past 19 years? Could it be that you have lived for the past 23 years? And if we were to check your dose here in heaven, there is no score. Is it possible that all this while, with the mercy of God and the grace of God that has been lavished on your life, nothing has been added to heaven on your account? What if the Lord appears tonight and calls upon your name and wants to speak concerning you? Could it be that you have not even discovered the reason you are here? This is why we cry. I told you there is nothing wrong in making progress in life. There is nothing wrong, wrong in prospering in life. We are all making the most of life. But I say everything we achieve in life, we count. If that thing is squandered on the reason for which we came here. God is too intelligent to bring you here for no reason. The first reason we cry for revival is so that we will become like unto the Father. In nature and in essence, being like Him and doing exactly what He wants us to be and do. If you don't know what to cry about, 
You may cry all your life, but you will amount to nothing. If you don't know what to live for, you may spend all your life reading and spending all you have, but it will be a wasted investment. Where does life begin to have meaning from? were more than 30 years old but they have not found out why they were born they had an occupation they had a life they were married but they have not found out why they were born and for the first time Jesus will speak and the meaning of their lives will be communicated he said follow me and we make you fishers of men so the reason these guys were born was not to fish fish but to fish men they never found it for more than 30 years. They were married men. They say, follow me. Follow me. There is a voice. Every man must hear for his life to have meaning. If you have not heard it, men may clap for you, but you will be light in heaven. The men that truly live their lives, Jesus calls them overcomers. It is angels that clap for them. They have rank. They have fame. They have popularity in the spirit realm. It doesn't matter the occupation they were doing, but everything they did counted in heaven. You must not be on the microphone. In the political corridor, you can be more popular in heaven than an apostle. In the market, you can be more popular in heaven than an apostle. It is not title based, it is ordination based. Why were you born? A lot have not discovered it. So they live life pursuing opportunities. They live life pursuing chance and luck. They live life pursuing privileges. A young man of 30 years graduated from school. He is waiting for an uncle to call him and say, come to Lagos. And then he leaves for Lagos and he thinks he has begun to succeed in life for 30 years. You don't know why you were born. There is an error. There is a cardinal deficiency in the way we were trained. 40 years old. How are you doing? We are managing. We are trying to survive. Because to him, it's when there is money in his pocket that life begins to count. What a shame. 30 years old. What are you doing now? Nothing. He may even have a job. But every Friday, he squanders his money in the club. He said he's having fun. He has not even had enough sense to understand why he has resources. 30 years old. There's a deficiency. On campus, 90% Christians go to the lecture hall on Monday. You find 50% naked. But they are going to church. They have not understood the meaning of life. They don't even know why they come before the Lord. They think it's a religious practice because they carry them from age one to church with their parents. They went to church every Sunday. So Sunday is a, is a church business. They just appear with their best dress, come to church. And the moment they are leaving church, their real life begins to manifest. Very calm and sober in church. Walk to take the Holy Communion and two hands are like this. Come to give offering and they are sober. But on Monday morning, the lady becomes a snake queen as they are called. 168 hours in a week. They spend three hours in church as fake people and spend 165 hours living as daughters of Jezebel. That's who they really are. A young man's processing in the mind, everything about his mind is about pleasure. A man who is supposed to define the meaning of others 
a man who is supposed to be a trailblazer and chart the course for others. Truly, we need a revival. Much activities in church, many churches, many pastors, but there are no burning ones. Leaders, pastors, over one billion Christians. 2.6 billion Christians in the world. But you cannot enter any of the mountains of influence and say there is a pillar burning. But one man will rise in Israel by the name John. And Jesus will come and say he was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing to dwell in his life for a season. He said the whole of Judea, the whole of Judea and Jerusalem went to one man in the wilderness. No title, no occupation, but he just stayed there because he discovered that according to what was written concerning him, his name in the spirit realm is the voice of the one crying. So when you ask him, who are you? He will not tell you I am John. They gave him John in time. He knows what his nomenclature is in heaven. Who are you? I'm the voice of the one crying. That's how they know me in heaven. So on earth, his voice kept echoing. Echoing from the borders of the wilderness. And the whole city will go to hear him. He was not telling them they will prosper. He was crying against their iniquity. But they could not resist him. Because everything he was doing was written concerning him. What will happen if 10 of us discover who we are? On this small campus, what will happen if 10 of us discover who we are? Somebody met John Wesley. They had to drive him from the whole city. Nowhere to open a church or preach. The only land they had was his father's grave. And he went and stood on it. You couldn't drive him from his father's grave. And there he gathered the whole city. And somebody asked him, how are you able to do this? And he said, I set myself on fire. The people come to watch me burn. How beautiful it is when a man discovers who he is. To ask people, why are you here? Who are you? They begin to define themselves by what people say about them. I am Dr. Matthew. I am Apostle Peter. I am the dad. But nothing to show that the supernatural realm backs them up. We need a revival. We need a revival. It's a shame for me to call myself a Christian. And the guy who is in my room, my Christianity has not impacted him. And every day I stand up, I gather myself around people that believe in what I believe. And then we are, we are, we are hailing ourselves. Hey, man of God, oh God, the prophet of God. Meanwhile, your roommate doesn't notice that anything is happening in your life. Apostle Peter, Apostle Joseph. But the small cubicle where you are living, you are three. You are the only one that knows Jesus. You come to make noise say that you are speaking in tongues every night. But nothing from your life affects them. It's a shame we don't evaluate ourselves. We are so impressed by what we do. But the world doesn't even notice what we are doing. You come to church, they say they are praying, they are praying at the garden. And ten of them, gaba, 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 wah, wah, wah. and then they are falling down, they are rolling everywhere. The next corner, five meters away, somebody is, is romancing again. He doesn't even notice what they are doing. He gets up. Hey, hey, God is coming. They don't even hear you. Won't you go back and, and, re, and reappraise yourself? I am, I am a prophet. I am a prophet. Every two years, somebody dies in your family. You are pursuing men of God and you have been a Christian for 10 years. We need a revival. The devil is having a few days because men have not woken up to the dictates of their ordination. When I look into history and I see the men God used, most of them had no charisma. Most of them didn't look like it. Most of them were obviously weak and frail. I looked upon Catherine Coleman's picture. I kept looking at her. I said, how can this woman shake the world? How is it possible? Then I understood 
that the reason we are failing is because we are full of ourselves. We have not come before the Lord with an honest heart. We need a revival. We say we have everything, but we have nothing to show. What an irony. Before you cough, he says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Before you cough, he says, I know who I am. I know who I am. Nothing to show. Nothing to show. And he has been saying, Darkness in the land. Darkness in the family. Meanwhile, a girl of 10 years is initiated into witchcraft. And that night she begins to fly. That night she can wreck a family. A girl of 10 years in the witchcraft coffin enters a family and she destroys the whole family. You will bring a band of prayer warriors. They can't even deliver her. We carry big Bibles. And when we walk, creating impression among ourselves, it's a shame. We need a revival. How was that girl taught the ways of the spirit? Her mind is not even yet mature. How was she taught the art of spiritual dynamics? That at the age of 10, she knows what to say and somebody dies. How was she able to grow in that level of wickedness that she can wipe out the whole family in so much dexterity, skill and intelligence? You can't even discern it. How do these people teach their protégés in the negative supernatural? That we come and shout in church for many months and somebody who is struggling with adultery, immorality, drunkenness, lying, cannot stop. Meanwhile, an innocent 10-year-old girl, a witch just meets her and in one week, she's already a witch. How do they teach their own people? How do they do their own business? That they become so proficient. And we will keep running religious routines. This is why we cry. We cry. Sometimes I come to church. While you are greeting the people. People are already falling everywhere. And then I look to heaven and I ask God. What will become of these people after they are falling? When they fall and they rise up and they go home, what will become of them? Preachers have become even so precious. Precious that they come for meeting until people fall down and they've not done anything. What becomes of these people? After they roll on the floor. I went back to the hotel yesterday and I told God, You are talking, people are running everywhere. Screaming. I said, Lord, touch their hearts. I'm tired of the show. Touch their hearts. What was it that Peter did? That Peter will speak to people. He was not even preaching. He just told them about Jesus. The same Jesus you crucified is today exalted, both as Lord and Christ. And the Bible said their heart was caught. And 3,000 people gave their hearts to Christ. Why did he speak that language he spoke? One man goes to stay in the wilderness and the whole city goes to meet him there. Here we have meeting, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, everywhere. But we cannot command the influence that this man commanded when they had no publicity strategy or material. We need a revival. You ain't, you ancient Zion king, Kado Oskado, you are mighty on your throne. You ain't, you ancient Zion king, Kado Oskado. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion King. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are 
doesn't know the fear of God. You are warning people, challenging people, talking to people about the wrath of God. Meanwhile, you are a preacher in immorality for seven years. And then they catch them. Then you come out and say, Guinness, to win the sentiment of people. How were you able to preach all those years? Do you know what you are talking about? We read Bible and we think it's about Bible. We talk Bible. The men that walk with God, that the Bible says we should look upon as an example. In their days, there was no Bible. The Bible said Enoch walked with God and was not. He said God bore him testimony that he pleased him. There was no scriptures. How did he know how to walk with God? He said when God warned Noah, he moved out of reverence and built the ark. And he said, by it, he became the heir of righteousness that is of faith. How did he know the fear of God? He was not reading any document. He said, when Abraham, God called Abraham, he moved. How did he know obedience? How did he enter into the protocol of faith? Had he not read any document? We reduce spiritual things to traditions, to dogmas, to acts and philosophies. A man is coming to talk about revival, whereas himself is dead in the spirit. Because he thinks revival is an intelligent teaching. He doesn't know revival is the fire of God consuming a soul. A man who should be praying and begging God to set him on fire comes to talk to people about revival. Meanwhile, he is dead in the spirit. And worst case scenario, some people argue that there is nothing like revival. <laughs> Too much knowledge. Philosophies have shut the gate of the spirit realm from us. Somebody is a Christian for 10 years, he doesn't know the voice of God. 10 years as a Christian, he doesn't know the voice of God. How have you been walking? The decisions you've been making, how have you been making them? 10 years as a Christian, you don't know the voice of God. You ask, you take a census in church and say, when was the last time God spoke to you? You will be shocked. You may not even see one hand. How have we been surviving? Meanwhile, all of us have titles. All of us are preachers on Facebook. Somebody sees something that he should meditate on to save his soul. As they see it, he's sharing it. He has not even meditated on it. He feels others need to hear it. Meanwhile, that message is for him. Sometimes I have too much burden that I can't share the word of God. I just wish we could cry and keep crying and keep crying and keep crying. Because it's as if everything has been taught. Any topic you want, click on Google, you will see five to seven messages on it. But there's no life in our spirit, man. We are weak. We are weak. We say, program, a man of God is coming, people gather. But eventually the man doesn't come, you know, say, let's pray for five hours. You'll be shocked that even the man on the pulpit cannot stand for five hours. You reign, you ancient Zion King, Kadosh Kadu, you are my Let's stand a river flow in 
your church once again. Let eternity be seen. You know, I thought I loved the Lord some years ago. I think about six, seven years ago. Can't remember. I said, Lord, whatever I have belongs to you. <laughs> and then I received my first hundred thousand. <laughs> and then the Lord came for hundred thousand. <laughs> you know, I have this saying, I'm always saying, spiritual experience is not doctrine. Doctrine is very important. Doctrine is the only basis for preserving the heritage of God in every generation. Doctrine is what defines the borderline of our experience. Outside of truth, every experience we have is a lie or is from the devil. Doctrine is the security system that God puts in place in order to preserve a generation. But we need to journey beyond doctrine into experience. So that we can really know the things that are encapsulated in doctrine. I thought I knew the Lord. I loved the Lord. Because everybody was saying, Lord, whatever you want, I will do. So we'll go for prayer meeting for five hours. We are on the wall. We are waiting. Lord, if you call me, I will not fail you. Anything you want, I will give you. And then 100,000 showed up. And the moment 100,000 came, Everything I needed to do became like a mountain. <laughs> Breathe 100,000. That was when I understood that love has many definitions. We need to cry. If God doesn't help you, your heart will fail you. You will think you are strong. You will think you will stand for God until something is manipulated from the spiritual realm. <laughs> Apostle will always tell us that anything that is orchestrated from the spirit realm will overwhelm mortality. Because by reason of ranking, the immortal realm is superior to the mortal realm. That's why you can be a professor of pneumatology. But a, a boy of 15 years that knows how to manipulate the spirit realm can violate what you know. You can be a professor emeritus. But a girl of 15 years in the witchcraft kobo can make you paralyzed. Your knowledge will be in your head. But that girl is interfacing a realm that is superior to the realm of your operation. You are functioning from the soulish realm, the preternatural realm. The girl is operating from the supernatural realm. So you can recite something for two hours. She comes and makes her hand. Pop, and she releases the demon. Because she's operating from a higher realm. We need to cry and press until we break into the immortals. Until we enter into the boundary of their dwelling and begin to define our lives from their perspective. Until we begin to see ourselves the way they see us. And we are able to manipulate the modalities that they put in place. We cannot have relevance with them. Ask the Lord to talk to your heart one more time. I will soon begin to fly. So that you are not left behind. You don't want to hear the preacher tonight. You don't want service as usual. Where you are excited, you jump and you say, Ooh, oh, this is a powerful service. And then after one week, you find yourself crying again. Because the things that you thought you overcame on account of the euphoria of the service, after three days, that excitement dies. And then those things confront you again. And you discover you didn't build up. The cure to your plague is the activation of the word of God in your spirit by the Holy Ghost. Can you ask the Lord to talk to your heart? I will not be sharing for too long. I will just strike some calls and then if the, if the realm opens, then we will begin to move by the spirit. River flow, river flow. Let it turn a river flow in your church once again. Let it turn it be this name. River flow, river flow. Let
Madisano River flow in your church once again. Let it turn it be seen. In every generation, God has a definite purpose. And the reason God brings us into different generations is because our appearance is dependent on the generation where our participation and role in the purpose of God is calculated into. The reason you didn't show up here 100 years ago is because there was no purpose for you in God 100 years ago. The reason you are here today is because it's in this day and time that you can future in the purpose of God. You know, it's like a movie. You begin to watch a movie. You have a major character that runs through all of the movie. But different characters begin to appear in the movie depending on when they are supposed to participate in the corporate expression of the purpose of that movie. So you can't just show up unless the time for your act is, is playing out. That's when you can teach up. So the reason you showed up now is because there's a corporate thing God is doing that you have a role to play in. You will count if you find that thing and you do it. And in every dispensation where God is working, there are definite counsels that define the borderline for that which God wants to do in that dispensation. Man that will be relevant in that dispensation must find the counsel of God for him in that dispensation. As he begins to walk by it, then he becomes relevant. The challenge is not that God has a purpose that can be achieved. The challenge is that the realm is open to other entities apart from God. If God is the only entity in this realm that determines the outcome of reality, you would have just left and then woke up and began to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. But unfortunately, God is not the only one that is in this game. When God began the project of creation, creation was sealed from every other entity that had power and authority to participate in the game. And God handed over the key to humankind in the form of his obedience to his laws. And so long as man stayed obedient to God, creation was locked away from every other entity that had the power to participate in fulfilling their own mandate that is different from the mandate of God. But Adam did not understand the implication of disobedience. You know, when God speaks to you sometimes, you don't understand the implication. God can come to you at night and say, Victor, from today, pray in tongues between 12 and 1 a.m. You have heard stories about men that prayed in tongues and things happened. But now God has told you pray in tongues. You may think God just wants you to build your prayer life. You don't understand the implication of what God has told you to do. Meanwhile, according to the economy of God, you know, he's called the Alpha and Omega. The word Alpha and Omega means beginning and end. It's not beginning and end. It means God is at the same time in the beginning and at the same time in the end. So it means God is the one that encompasses everything that plays out in expression in time. So when God shows up and says, pray in tongues between 12 and 1 a.m., and maybe at this time you were 21 years old, or you were 24 years old, so you thought, ah, God wants me to build my prayer life. So you go for fellowship and you say, oh boy, God came to me yesterday and said, I should begin to pray from 12 to 1. You have not sat down to contemplate how God operates. So you thought what God told you was story. So for three months you violate it. And every night your heart begins to beat. You feel uncomfortable. You become restless. What you don't know is that whether you will become anything big in this life may be dependent on that one instruction. Because the day that you will need favor, 10 years later, you may not have the opportunity to pray. So God went 10 years into your future. And when he discovered that what you are supposed to do by favor, you cannot achieve that favor. In order to keep you in the boundary of safety, he came 10 years into the past and gave you an instruction. Say, pray between 12 and 1. You, in your own mundane expression, you thought God wanted you to increase your prayer capacity. You don't know that God is creating an insurance policy for your future. 
So for those six months when those instructions came, you may violate the prayer. And then 15 years later, you come to where your life should be defined. And then you begin to cry, Lord have mercy. What you don't know is that 15 years ago, Lord already released mercy. But you violated the protocol of mercy. Such was the crisis of Adam when God showed up in the garden of Eden. He said, do not eat this fruit. In the day you eat of it, you shall die. Adam did not even know what death meant. Maybe his own expression. You know, Adam had some level of understanding. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 19, the Bible said, God asked him to name the animals. And he said, every name that Adam gave the animals was the name thereof. That means, to a very large extent, Adam had the power to tap into the boat of Zion and to peep into things that were locked in the chambers of heaven. So Abraham, Adam was operating at some level of wisdom, at some level of insight. So when God told him, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. Perhaps he thought that death was cessation of life. Perhaps he thought that death was departure from mortality. He didn't understand what God meant. When God said, if you eat this fruit, you shall die. He didn't know that the key of all the realms of God hinged on that instruction. The day Adam ate that fruit, that day, he handed over his authority to Satan. Satan became the god of this world. Adam never realized that while he was in this world, he was a god. So death was beyond cessation from mortal body. Death was actually dethronement of spiritual authority. Death was actually stepping away from ordination so that another entity can walk into it. So when God gives an instruction and you violate it, you may think you will come back later and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you cry from morning to night. And because you release tears, biochemical processes take place and then you are relieved. And you say, oh, thank God, I'm forgiven. And then you go back to the fellowship. You carry the mind. You say, go, go. <laughs> you didn't know that because you violated that authority, something has happened. Somebody else has been coronated. That assignment you were carrying out was a throne in the realm of the spirit. The law for sitting on that throne was what God told you. That looked like a one sentence statement. Yes, you will ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you. But what has happened? You have lost your place. Did you know why the Bible says giving no place to the devil? Because a place is where you stand and you exercise spiritual authority. So Adam thought eating the fruit was just an act of disobedience. That forgiveness can remit him with. But what happened to him is that he lost his place of authority. So when God showed up in the garden, God could not find Adam anymore. Where Adam was standing in the spirit realm, he had lost that place. It was Satan that was standing there now. So God showed up. He said, Adam, Adam, where are thou? Adam said, I hid myself. No, you can't hide from God. What has happened is that you have lost your place. So the authority you have to preserve the earth has been taken from you. So when Satan came to tempt Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, he said, bow down to me and I will give you all that you see and the glory thereof. For it has been handed over to me. So what gave Adam authority over the earth? That was what he, he, he bargained away when he decided to disobey God. As if that was not enough. <laughs> Satan did not only come into the world, he came with all his government functionaries. Death was one of them. Because Adam did what? Violated a simple instruction. These are some of the things that people are not taught. So you think you can fornicate because you felt, oh, I couldn't stop myself. And then you ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you. But there are things you will never enter in life again. Not because God is wicked, but Things are at different energy levels in the spirit. There, is, there are certain things you do that your soul can no longer ascend to touch realities that are in high energy levels. Hope you know the Bible says, when we wait upon the Lord, we mount up with wings like the eagles. When you come high, you become like God. In Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28, it said, God is the only one. It said, have you not heard? Have they not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not, neither is he weary? He said, he giveth power to the faint, and unto them that have no might, he increases strength. So, according to that scripture, God is the only entity that doesn't know how to faint. He doesn't know how to be weary. So, even if God walks for one year, the more he walks, he will be the way he is. God can't faint, he can't be weary. 
but man naturally has the ability to fit. But God said there's a technology in himself that when you wait on him, you mount up. So when you come higher in verse 31, he said you will run, you will not be weary. You will walk, you will not faint. So there is a place in heaven, there's a place in a height in the spirit that if a man can get to, then he can begin to function like God. Now, there are certain things you do, just the way if you wait on God, something happens to your soul and your soul ascends. And you can begin to walk in possibilities that are only prerogatives of God. There are other things that if you do, instead of your soul ascending, your soul will deplete. The ability to walk and not faint and run and not be weary, it's in the place in the spirit. When you wait on God, you go to that place. But there is also another thing. When you do certain things, your soul deplete. And then you can no longer walk in dimensions that were your best right. You can no longer walk in dimensions that are your heritage. So this is why every hour we cry for revival. Because we know that there is something God wants to do in this generation. That there is an energy level we must hit in the spirit before we can achieve it. When the devil comes to fight you, he will not waste his resources on every part of you. The devil will look for that thing that will make it possible for you to fulfill the agenda of God. That is what the devil will fight. That is why our battles are different. Somebody else's battle is lying because there's a trigger on his tongue. Somebody else's battle is immorality because he has the eyes of an eagle. The devil wants to blind him in the spirit. If he's blind, if he lies, he should pray for money tonight. He cannot do what God wants him to do. The guy that is three guys on his tongue, if his tongue is corrupt, no matter what he do, he cannot fulfill the agenda of God. Somebody else is three guys in his hand. So when the devil comes to fight, he will fight you based on where your greatest strength lies. And if he can break it, he has crippled you. For Adam, his strength was in keeping the instructions of God. And Adam did not understand that every other thing depended on it. And he violated it. This is the trick the devil has used in every generation. And every time a generation notices that the devil is beginning to strike them on their Achilles heels, a generation begins to cry. So that help will come from Zion. Because the generation knows that if the devil is able to cripple them, then they are lost in the calendar of heaven. It's possible for a whole generation to be lost. This is why we cry revival. In the days of John the Baptist, there was darkness for 400 years. There was no prophet. God had promised through Isaiah that a prophet will rise and he will open the door for the Messiah to come. The devil knew. So the devil began to cripple the prophetic. If there is no prophet to declare the coming of the Messiah, then the Messiah will not come. I may not be able to stop the Messiah from coming, but I know the protocol. The protocol is that a prophet will announce his coming. The moment a prophet announces his coming, the door is open. So what will I do? I can't fight God in heaven, but I can stop the prophetic on earth. So for 400 years, there was darkness. There was no prophet. And so long as there was no prophet, the Messiah didn't show up. Two men began to pray. Enos, the prophet. Simon, the prophet, they began to pray day and night, day and night, until a point came, God had to promise Simeon, he said, you will not see death until you see the salvation of Israel. This man prayed until a voice rose. You know, I told you something about intercession yesterday. I say you may be an intercessor, you may not be known, but you will be shocked that the heaviest reward will rest with you. Even John the Baptist did not know that the reason a prophet emerged after 400 years of darkness was because of Enos and Simeon. Pray for their lives. I, Zacharias and Elizabeth were also praying. They were praying for a son. They didn't understand the bigger purpose. So God had no promise for them concerning what he wanted to do. But these were men that knew that for the Messiah to come, a prophet must rise. So their prayer point was about the Messiah. About the Messiah. And when their prayer hit a crescendo in the spirit, God released John. And the angel could not wait. While John was in his mother's womb, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
God was urgent to do what he wanted to do. God was in a hurry to do what he wanted to do. Because for 400 years, the devil understood how to violate the protocol. There was no prophetic voice in Israel. The reason no prophet rose was not because prophets were not born, but because there was something the devil did that kept them in darkness. Hope you know that when Jesus finally came, the Bible said the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, Matthew 4, 16, he said the people that dwelt in darkness. So everybody that had a mandate that showed up was covered in darkness. You will not know what God wants to do in this territory because there may be darkness. So everybody that comes here with a potential, the devil knows what to do. Maybe your own trigger is on your tongue and from the day you enter the campus, from that day, the devil puts a gist on your tongue. And for four years, you talk that story until you leave. Everybody knows you as the biggest Barcelona fan. So the man who should prophesy the move of God in this campus is the one that analyzes everything about Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Everywhere he comes, they begin to, hey, ah, 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 see the football analyst. Then he walks like this. And then he, after two seconds, he begins to talk. In 1996, when Barcelona prayed Real Madrid, on the 21st minute, he's quoting with precision. He doesn't know that they have put a plague on his tongue. That tongue is supposed to be the trigger that unlocks the potentials of God on this campus. But the devil knows. The guy that came that's supposed to be a lead among the intercessors. Maybe what God brought him to the campus to do was to raise the Deborah generation. Because God knows that the heritage of, of, of the, his heritage on this campus dwelt with the young ladies. So he came on campus. Every lady is attracted, drawn to him. And then he thought it was about his beard. So he begins to shape the beers like this. When they are in the lecture hall, he sits at the back. And then three girls are here, three are here. All right, no problem. After the lecture, he walks like this. And then one girl holds here, another girl holds here. That is the man who is supposed to raise the Deborah generation. But the devil puts an insatiable appetite for sex in his bowels. So the devil understood that the prophetic was the only thing that could usher in the Messiah for 400 years. There was no prophet. A strategy, a protocol from the demonic realm was activated and it shut down every prophetic voice. Until two men began to cry revival. And when their prayers ascended to the heavens, God himself came and promised Simeon that you will see it in your lifetime. And John rose. The moment John rose, a revival began. The Bible said the whole Jerusalem, the whole Judea went to him in the wilderness. A revival had begun. Suddenly, the consciousness of God was awoken in the heart of people. These were people that wake up in the morning and they go to brothels. They were enjoying themselves and living their lives. But all of a sudden, the voice has risen. And everybody is heading into the wilderness. To hear John. Everybody is on his way to the wilderness. A revival has begun. Revival is a reawakening of the consciousness of God and his operation in our soul. It's possible for you to be born again, but there will be no consciousness of God in your spirit. Paul said in Galatians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, If you are dead in Christ, he said, therefore, let your mind and your affection be on the things that are above. So it is possible to be a believer, but the only thing that forms your consciousness is your appetite. What will you eat? What will you drink? What will you wear? When the revival begins, the consciousness of men is reprogrammed back to God. Men begin to seek the face of God, and only then can the mandate of heaven play out of time. Remember, Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is man that has the authority to bring the will of God that is in heaven to pass on earth. But when men are not conscious of God, the will of God will remain locked in heaven. The problem is that God will not lose. Because even before he began to create, he was God. When creation is over, he will still be God. It is man, it is that generation that we lose. This is why we cry revival. So that men can become conscious of God again and live their lives based on the command power that is in the office of the Christ. 
When you take a census in church, you'll be amazed what informs predominantly the consciousness of people. Predominantly. If you were to take an appraisal of yourself in the next one minute, you will know what your consciousness is. If your consciousness is not predominantly God, you need a revival. Some come on campus and they find a girlfriend, a boyfriend, and for four months, you just see them smiling. Every time they are on their phone, quack, 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 what's up? They are smiling. They are just talking. What is happening? That boy has become their consciousness. You need a revival. Some is only their exam. Your exam is your primary objective in this campus. Very important. Make it your priority. But your exam should never take the place of God. Your studies should never take the place of God. Because the reason you must prosper is so that you can be relevant in the agenda of God. It's not the agenda of God that will be relevant in your exam. There are many people that think God is out to make them pass exam. God will make you pass exam. But remember, everything you are and become should be relevant for God. Not God be relevant for what you have. If those priorities are not well defined, there will be crisis. And this is the crisis we have. Because we were not taught correctly. Somebody made a statement very profound. He said, God is not interested in your purpose. He said, God is interested in his purpose and your part in that purpose. The devil knows. When the devil gives to men, he will first of all educate them to know that everything he's giving them is about himself. And these men know they don't joke with it. Have you seen a wealthy man that got his money from the waters? Everything he has is about the devil. He will never joke with it. Because that's how spirits operate. The reason God doesn't use force on you is because God wants it to be an act of worship. If you are forced, if you are compelled, if you are manipulated, it's no longer worship. It's no longer a faith action. And the Bible said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God wants you to be the one to seek Him, not Him comparing you to Him. And that has left a lot of people in a state of marketing. Need revival. We need revival. What is your predominant consciousness? If it is not God, you need revival. That's why revival is not shouting and running. Revival is not screaming and acting in a hysteric fashion. Sometimes the presence of God becomes strong. Your emotions are overwhelmed. But it's beyond emotion, brother. When you depart and you are alone, when you are in the lecture hall, when you are in the market, what is your consciousness? What do you live for? And what can God entrust into your hand? That is revival. A point comes when God releases his spirit upon a generation. And then he commissions a generation to do what was not happening on earth before. A revival has begun. Because a consciousness has been created. Can I tell you something? God is not just out to begin a revival. It's revival is God wants to raise. It's one thing to have a revival. And people are moving after God because somebody is leaving, leaving them. It's another thing to have a clan of revivalists where everybody is partying. That's what God wants to do. So God is not bringing a revival. God is raising revivalists. So that all of us can be a clan of burning people. But it begins with consciousness. And the devil will want to destroy that thing that forms your strength. That thing that forms the block and the foundation of your spiritual consciousness. If you study the book of Acts, chapter 4, from verse 1 to 4. Peter was going to the temple with John in Acts chapter 3. They had healed the man that was born lame. And on account of the miraculous dimension of God that broke upon them, something began in the temple. And the Bible said they began to preach to the people. They laid hands on them, baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And it said that day alone, 3,000 was added to the church. And suddenly the elders, the St. Henry, shows up and arrested them. 5,000 people rather converted in one meeting. The elders came and arrested them. And what did the elders do to them? Look at the scripture. How be it many of them which heard the word believed and the number of men that were was about 5,000. The same message that they were preaching, something broke upon them. They preached that message and in one day, 5,000. Go to the next verse. 
and see what the elders did. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and the elders and Enos the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Next. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this? The man that was healed at the beautiful gate. How did you do this? They began to interrogate them. They began to threaten them. They began to rain havoc on them. So that what informed their conviction? I want to show you what the devil does to you. So that when you leave this meeting, you will know what to protect. Some of you may leave this meeting and your prayer altar will be revived. So apart from the experience in the meeting, that prayer altar that is revived is your reviver. So long as you monitor it and keep it burning, you will burn. Some of you will leave this meeting, this conference, and then the word of the Lord will come alive in your spirit. The hunger for the word will begin. Stay there. When the devil comes to fight, he will not fight everything about you. He will fight that thing that was awakened. Some of you is fasting. The hunger for fasting will be born again. The devil will come to fight it. Some of you, what will be born will be the quest for evangelism. Those are the things the devil will fight. I want to show you how the devil strategizes. Your church, once again, Lord, eternity be seen. Go to verse 8 quickly. After they had threatened them, the Bible said, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means is it made, is he, by what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you all. The man began to preach. He began to preach Jesus to them again. And in verse 13, the Bible said something. The men saw the miraculous. They could not deny it because the man that was healed stood with them. But there was something they saw in them that was the basis for their motivation. It was their boldness. They saw that the boldness these guys had, these guys have, they will take over the whole Jerusalem. And see what the Bible said. And now when they saw their boldness, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, and they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they were with Jesus. That dimension of boldness was the greatest threat. These men saw that it was not just the miraculous. The courage and the boldness these men have we cause them to walk into fire. And that was what was lacking. And if they continue with this boldness, something will go wrong. You will leave a meeting and have an encounter. The devil will know that if you continue with this hunger for prayer, something will happen. So when he comes, he will fight your prayer altar. The devil can begin to bless you that time. You don't understand. I told you there is a politics that go on in the realm. If the devil sees that your attention has been drafted to your prayer altar, the devil can make three people to begin to look for your attention. You were on campus the 300 level. You were struggling to have a girlfriend. No girl had your time. You now went for a meeting. You came back. Your altar was hot. You began to pray every night. And suddenly every evening, a lady shows up and says, Hmm, so you like this, don't forget me, ba. Where are you coming from? See, <laughs> there are times when I come and I burn like fire. But there are times when you show people the little, little secrets that they underrate. You don't forget me, but this lady has not called you for six months. Why is it now that fire is beginning to burn on your altar? She shows up on her own. You don't forget me, but And then that you don't forget me, but the devil puts an amplifier. And then you hear it. You go to lie down like this. You don't forget me, Ba. You don't forget me, Ba. You don't forget. The lady you bought 
500 naira recharge card for that didn't send you a text to say thank you. Now you went for a meeting, you came back. There was a button to eat the word of God. And then you began reading. And then you see a text message. Hi, Peter. Are you around at all? Hmm. You, you know the check on person again, no? And then suddenly Peter begins to think of his phone. He wants to, you want to carry the phone and the Holy Ghost says, hmm. Peter doesn't know that manipulation is already going on in the realm. You carry the phone, you want to die the number. It's as if your heart wants to melt. The Holy Ghost moves in your heart. Don't! Peter. Peter, 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 Peter is now battling between life and death. Battling between. If you make that call, you are gone. Even if heaven moves, you are gone. Because the whole support heaven has for you has already been revealed. Peter, you want to die. If you are wise, that's the time to shut down everything and begin to pray in tongues. Pray in tongues for three hours until all that emotion dies. Then ask yourself, why should I call her? Don't you notice what happened? Jesus was walking the air doing miracles. The devil was not moved. The moment Jesus said he wanted to go to Jerusalem, the devil knew he was heading for the cross. Instantly, the man that moved in the Holy Ghost, Peter, was the the devil came instantly and Peter drew Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus knew it was not Peter. They get behind me, Satan. For thou suffereth not the things that be of God, but of man. This is why Jesus survived. At the brink of time, when he had accepted to make all the sacrifice, the devil came again. Jesus will go to get somebody. He would mobilize prayer support, the Son of God. Mobilize prayer support. And Jesus will go and throw himself on the ground and was begging the Father. Because he knew that if abortion doesn't take place, that thing that was growing in his soul will make him violate the cross. That was the first time you will know that Jesus had a will that was different from the will of the Father. You would never have known. But there was a protocol of darkness that wanted to separate the perfect harmony that was between Jesus and the Father. And Jesus knew that there was a, it's a crisis. So he went, he stayed there until it was aborted. And when it was aborted, the same Jesus that wanted to miss in action showed up and said, let's go, the time has come. You don't know how it works. That's why you keep falling. When the devil comes, he will come for that thing that makes you to stand. The revival meeting will come for nothing unless you understand the intelligence to keep standing. The revival meeting is not so important because you fell down and cried. We know what to do to get people falling and rolling everywhere. I didn't preach yesterday. People were running everywhere. We know what to do. But precepts are the things that make people stand. A fire may come on you and it will be burning on your head literally. But if you don't know what to do to stand, in three days you will dissipate it. The devil comes for your strong bone. He said in verse 18, Mark, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 18. See what the, the Bible said they did to them. He said, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. They didn't stop them from doing their miracles. Go ahead and do your miracles. But never again preach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And in verse 20 he said, For we cannot but speak. The argument was not about the miracle. The argument was predicated upon their boldness. If this man remain bold, they will take over this territory. Let's fight it out of them. And in verse 21 he said, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go. Finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all, for all men glorified God for which he has done. He further threatened them. You would not notice what happened in that scripture. But what they did had depleted the goodness of the apostles. And when they returned to their own camp, see their prayer. 
in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, the same chapter, verse 31. And they say, and when they had prayed, first of all, see the substance of their prayer in verse 29. He said, and now Lord, behold their threatenings. That arrow the devil shot had gotten them in their strongest point. Their boldness was being depleted. Behold, they are threatening and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may preach the gospel. This man had understanding on how to preserve the move of God in their lives. They knew the arrow the devil shot and they went for that arrow. Their prayers were not scattered it was effectual and well directed. Behold their threatening. Grant boldness. And in verse 31 the Bible said, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were, assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. You come for a meeting like this, the devil will fashion different weapons for different people. Yours may be on your prayer because that's what the Lord will kindle. Yours may be on your fasting. Yours may be on your giving life. Yours may be on your evangelism life. Find out what the Lord will kindle and guide it jealously. That is what will determine the destiny and the texture of your life. The Holy Ghost will do everything with your cooperation to preserve it. But if you fail to preserve it, you have already wasted the potentials of the meeting. The potentials of the meeting is not necessarily in what happens in... Sometimes we come, we judge based on what happens in the hall. That's where we miss it. What we should look at is not the life in our service. It's the life in our territory. What happens in the territory is the proof of the quality of what is happening in the hall. As we begin to pray this evening, most of you, your altars will be set on fire. Most of you, your work with God will be kindled. You need to guide it. In Revelation chapter 4, chapter 2 verse 4, Jesus gave a testimony about the church in Ephesus. He saw their manifestations. They proved the apostles. He saw the demonstration of God in their midst. He said, I have one thing against you. You have lost your first love. That's a church with the miraculous. That's a church with wonders. But they needed a revival. Their strength in heaven was not the miraculous. Their strength was their intimacy with God. God was their motivation. Before now, they didn't do miracles because they had powers to do miracles. They did miracles because they were motivated of the Spirit to glorify the Father. But they have come to a point where they have mastered how it works. So when they go out, when you challenge them, they do miracles to show you that they are anointed. God said their first love was lost. The moment the first love was lost, the activity was nonsense. Have we not come to a point where we know how to make the church excellent? So we come for the service, we know how to stage the programs. We know how to make things happen in the service. But God is not there. We do all the dancing, we do all the charade in the church, but we go out, God is not in our world. We need a revival. Going back to what really counts and what God is doing in our individual lives. There are lots of people in the church, congregation growing, but you call somebody and you say, what is God doing in your life now? He doesn't know. Because there's no work with God. We need a revival. What is God doing in your life today? Can you point it out? You need a revival. If you can't point out what God is on, the project God is upon in your life now, you need a revival. The elders of old, their lives instruct me so much. God will come to Enoch, and the only thing God will look and speak concerning Enoch was that Enoch pleased him. Enoch walked with him, so Enoch pleased him. So Enoch guarded his work with the Lord jealously, and God will bear testimony. God will come to Noah and the only thing God will point in Noah's life was that Noah feared the Lord. There were many crazy manifestations in the life of Noah. The ark that took Noah 100 years to build. Noah saw the whole dimension of that ark in a vision. Can you beat that level of word of knowledge? The ark that he built for 100 years. All the dimensions of the ark he was seeing it in the spirit realm and was building it. 
But when God came, he didn't speak about Noah's dexterity in, his, in the spirit realm. He spoke about the fear of God. And the fear of God in Noah's life became the qualitative assurance for determining what true service is. So your service will only be accepted when there is reverence in your life. So everything Noah did was reverent as far as God was concerned. Abraham's life, with all the move of God, the Bible said Abraham was old and seeking in age. The Lord had blessed him in all things. Abraham was the definition of prosperity. But when God came, God looked at his feet. They knew what to keep. They knew what to guide. Because every day of their life, they know what God is doing. What is God doing in your life? A man who cannot trace what God is doing in his life by time needs a revival because he has lost his bearing. You can be a leader in church. God doesn't judge people by church, church ranking. Moses that saw the invisible God, when God showed up, God commended his faithfulness. He said Moses was faithful in all of the house of God. That was what Moses guided. What is that thing in your life that God can define you by? That's the revival of God in your life. Many Christians have lost it. Is it important to pray for blessings? Very, very important. But if you lost what is between you and God, you are lost. Peter came, he said, I have no silver nor gold. He said, but such as I have with God. That's a man born in. Such as I have. They supernaturalize is your advantage. What is it you have with God? When we come for revival meetings, we want to quicken what we have with God so that that thing will become the bearing, the defining factor of our lives. There are many people today who are lukewarm. The Bible said, because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So even God rejects men. It's better you are falling and you are seeking help than to be in between. Because even God will reject you. Revival is not running around on the street. Revival is the ability to commend and to beg the move of God. Born in people. Born in people. Born in people. What is it that you have to guide jealously? That's what the Holy Ghost will reveal to you tonight. As you leave this meeting, I want to show you what God will begin to do in your life. And then I'll begin to pray. When you come for the meeting, and the Lord releases the fire on you, then God carries you through a syllabus of training. I will show you in the next five minutes, and then we'll begin to pray. If you look at the stories of revival through the Bible, you will discover that all these men follow this syllabus of training. All of them. They follow this syllabus. I'll just pick a few significant revivers in the scriptures. And then I'll show you how God dealt with all of these men. And then you'll discover that the reason certain things happen to your life, happen to you and in your life, is not because you are unfortunate. Some of the things you call crisis, what you don't know, they are actually syllabus in the school of the spirit. Some of the things you call affliction, if you don't know, some of them may be syllabus in the school of the spirit. God wanted to bring you to a point where you can rely on him completely. This is how God raised this revivalist. Revivalists are not born in the classroom. Revivalists are hewn from the cave of fire. They walk through the fire. They walk through the water. They understand what it means to walk through the fire and not to be born. So they can carry the flame of God to their world. They understand what it means to walk through the waters and not be drowned. It's not in the classroom you raise revivalists. I will show you what God does with them. If you look at the days of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham was in the hall of the Chaldees. According to Stephen in Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. The Bible says God had spoken to Abraham when he was in the hall of the Chaldees to leave his country, to leave his kindred, to leave his father's house. Abraham never moved. What carried Abraham from 
the hall of the Chaldees to Haran was his own father terror. So the same way all of us encounter God. Maybe yours may be in a revival meeting. Yours may be in the place of prayer. You encountered God and God wants to begin to train you. And you violate. That's the same way Abraham violated God. He said God had told him. But the man will not move. Until his father died. His father that was the source of his confidence died. Abraham was so connected to his family that it was difficult for him to break that fraternity. So his confidence was in his bond with his family. So God wanted to detach. That's how God raises survivalists. He detaches you from everything that informs your confidence. God wanted to detach him. He said, leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your father's house. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Then I will bless you. He said, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by thee. But what? Depart, detach, be separated. An instruction Abraham will not obey until his father died. And when his father died, gathered himself and began to walk out of the land. Yet, he carried Lot. Have you not come for a meeting or gone for a meeting before and you are set on fire and God gives you the same instruction he gave Abraham? Leave everything. And then you are trying to find the justification in departing from some persons. And God insists rigidly leave. And then you fail to depart from those people until a point came that fire died. And then you went back crying and you don't find it. Has it not happened to you before? Set on fire, burning for God. He said, but you have to leave. And then you don't. I have experienced it many times. Many times. Sometimes a revival even come. God tells you to depart from a certain location and go somewhere and retreat for some time. And then you say, okay, I will go next week. Next week come, I will go next week. After some time, the whole fire goes down. And then when there is no fire anymore, you carry to come back and you say, we are going to a kitchen to Babalola Mountain. We will pray for seven hours. Then you come. When you finish praying, you have headache. You come back home and relax. You frustrate the grace of God. The intelligence of managing and stewarding revival. A lot don't have it. Abraham moved. God began to teach him how to make his hands strong. If your confidence remains on anything apart from God, you are not a candidate of revival. If God wants you to set people on fire, He will carry you through the coals of fire yourself. The hottest crisis of life, sometimes God will allow you to go through it. You will cry many nights. You will, you will scream. You will do everything until you are broken. Then God can break out through you. At that point, like Paul will say, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. When you see a man get to that level, a revivalist has been born. The Bible says God carried Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, verse 6, he said he took him to Sichem and to Moriah. And from there he carried him to Bethel, to Ai and to Bethel. You read those things, you just thought they were locations. Those things were physical locations, but they were prophetic indications of the kinds of training that Abraham went through. The word Sikem is the word shoulder. The word more is the word teacher. In the ancient days, they carried load and bodies on their shoulders. It's not now that you carry a jerrycan like this. Those days when you carry a, lo a luggage, a load, a body, you keep it on your shoulder and you move. They carry bodies on their shoulders. So the kind of teaching God was giving Abraham was a kind of teaching that attracted body. So he carried him to the place of the shoulder. And he was teaching him the ways of revival. Abraham went through so many crises. 
and God was teaching him. So God will stand on the subject of faith for 25 years until he believed. The guy will run to Egypt. God will allow him. When he goes there and is prostrated, then God will come and they will pursue him from Egypt. He will come back to the promised land. It's the dealing of Sikhem. You are praying to God, set this land on fire. Set us on fire. Then God brings you to Sikhem. And then things begin to go wrong. You don't know why. What is happening? Lord, what is happening? Some of us, the day we say God use us, that was the day we created the greatest problem of our lives. Because we were people that trusted in the flesh. And the Bible says, woe unto the man that trusted in flesh. He said, the arm of flesh we fail. Every time God wants to raise the revival, he brings you into the path of seeking. He begins to furnish you with bodies. And then he teaches you the way of the spirit by bodies. You will stay there until you master that syllabus. And the point comes as you gravitate from that place. You will learn a new technology that is beyond what you know. Maybe the technology you know now is the technology of phone call. So every time there's a crisis, there are four uncles that if you call to, something must happen. So you call Lagos. If Lagos doesn't work, Portacot will work. If Portacot doesn't work, Abuja will work. You are a master of the phone technology. You will never be on fire. When God wants to walk, then he separates. He brings you to seek him. And then all of a sudden, you want to call Portacot. Then things go wrong. You call Lagos, things go wrong. You call Abuja, things go wrong. Then you will come for the first time and you will look to the God of heaven. That time you are ready for school. That time your territory is about to be delivered. It is a strategy that God uses for every man that he uses in all generations. Those bodies will keep you there and you will cry many nights until a point comes you will learn something that does not have its root in the bearing of human civilization. The moment Abraham left Sikhen, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 that he built an altar. For the first time, Abraham had learned another intelligence that was different from fraternity with family. Before this time, the confidence of Abraham was in the fact that he lived in oneness with his family. He could not understand what God wanted when God said be separated. What God wanted to achieve through Abraham would only be possible on the strength of his intimacy with God. For so long that family was in the line, that level of intimacy that can bear dimensions of God in the extreme was not possible. So God carried him to seek him. When Abraham passed the test of seek him, the only thing Abraham knew to do was the technology of altars. So the Bible said when Abraham left seek him, he built an altar unto the Lord. At this point, he had found a new family. His family had migrated from earth. He had now built another fraternity in the heavens. Did you read in the Bible when the Bible said, we, the family on earth and in heaven. Abraham had found a new league of fraternity. He had come to understand relationship with spirit beings. It was this lifestyle that he began to live that brought him to a point where he was able to separate himself from Lot. And he separated himself from Lot and God appeared again. And in Genesis chapter 3 verse 18, the Bible said he departed to the plains of Mamre and there he built an altar. Altar now became the lifestyle of Abraham. Abraham go, went nowhere unless an altar was built. And every time Abraham departed, he removed his tent, but the altar remains there as an eternal memorial. That was how Abraham secured the boundaries of Bethel. Bethel was not taken over by intelligence. It was taken over by the technology of altars. Abraham littered Bethel with altars. Everywhere Abraham went, he raised an altar. This time around, he had learned how to live apart from his family. You may not know how to live away from masturbation and still have excitement in your soul. So the only thing that gives you pleasure will be masturbation. So you'll be a slave of masturbation for five years. You may not know what pleasure is unless you have a girlfriend that you call every 5 a.m. in the morning and she tells you she loves you until you understand how to service the fire of God in your life. Abraham came to a point in secret and he understood that for him, pleasure was the way of altars. So he began to litter everywhere with altars. And in Genesis chapter 18, from verse 1, the Bible said, Abraham saw men standing in the plains of Mamre. Instantly he knew that these ones are my family members. He didn't need anybody to introduce them. He said, Sir, Sir, come. Instantly he prepared a banquet because these ones, they don't look like the men in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. 
These ones came from heaven. And by altar, he has built a new fraternity. So when he saw them, he knew that these ones are my fathers. These ones are my brothers. He invited them into the house. Immediately, he went and created a banquet. He had known something that could not be taught him within the borderlines of mortality. He learned it in secret. That the only way that the commandment of God can come to pass in his life was to create a new order of lifestyle, the way of orders. Such was the pattern that Abraham created. Because he knew the only way you can leave your family and still have a family is by altars. So his family migrated from earth to heaven. And when men came from heaven, he knew them. You want to leave masturbation? They, so long as that masturbation remains, you will fall down in church ten times. That masturbation will rob you of fire. It will rob you of fire. And when the Holy Ghost wants to break it, it may not be by anointing. You will be praying, Lord, help me. Then God carries you through a circumstance. And as you obey him and follow, you want to ask for help, you say, no, pray. You go through that circumstance. You want to ask your father. You want to ask your uncle, you say, no, pray. And as you are walking through that circumstance, when you come out on the other side, then you will now ask yourself, when was the last time I masturbated? You had passed through sickness. So the body has been lifted. You have taken upon yourself the body of God. That's how God preserves fire in the life of people. And this is the technology of preserving the fires of revival. Every man that God used to steward the revival must go through the path of separation. It's the teaching syllabus of seeking. And every time they came out, they learned something that had a supernatural foundation. For Abraham, it was the way of all tasks. When Moses, God wanted to birth revival in, in Egypt, he went to a man called Moses. The guy was in the course of Pharaoh as a prince, I told you yesterday. God carried him into the wilderness. And for 40 years, a prince that was served all his life became a shepherd. He was carrying sheep to the, the desert every day and coming back. Do you know how frustrated the guy was? Sometimes he would sit down and say, is this me? When did I get here? God was teaching him. God was teaching him. Because the men he was coming to stir up, they behaved like animals. The only way he could master how to handle Israel was to go and train animals for 40 years. He would think, what's going on here? What am I doing here? They didn't know that he was walking through the chamber of destiny. And when he came out from there, he could carry 3 million people from Egypt that knew nothing. And God would tell him, teach them laws. Teach them ordinances. Teach them statutes. They knew nothing about God because even their patriarchs had no structured system of relating with God. Moses had to come with a new kind of intelligence of training people that were in bondage in a strange land, under strange cultures for 430 years. How do you begin that? Except as he went through the gate of separation. And in Moses' experience, God reduced him to a point of being a shepherd. That was when he gained the skill that was needed to activate a revival. You are hoping that God will use you as a revivalist in your time to set men on fire. You will never escape this job. The process of making of a revivalist. The pathway of seeking. We come to pray and when we leave the prayer meeting we do what we want. We don't understand how spirits work. God will walk, walk himself into you so much. He will chisel your soul until a point come when even when you cough, you cough God. You don't know how you get there. But you have walked with him until nothing else counts. Everything that was important to you, God breaks it off your life. For Paul, God appeared to him in an open encounter. Hope you know that all these men had graphic encounters with God. So encounters don't create revival. It is walking through process that brings about the ability to orchestrate revival. All of them had encounter. Abraham had encounter with God in Mesopotamia. There was no revival. Moses had encounter with God in Horeb. No revival. God walks himself through a man. Paul said when he pleased the father to redeem his son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood, but I went into Arabia. What do you mean? 
Jesus has been revealed to you. What are you separating yourself to do again? Because process has to come in. And when he came back from Arabia, everywhere he went to and spoke, they said, this one is a God. They said, the gods have come among men. You violate process, you want to become something. You are a joker. We can have many meetings on this campus, but until men are taught how to bend their neck and allow God to walk himself into them, there will never be revival. We can psych ourselves in church, but if we want to see the true texture of our corporate persona, it's when we visit our markets, visit our offices, visit our campuses. That is when we will know whether there is revival in the land. Did you read about John the Baptist? In Luke chapter 1 verse 80, the son of a priest, the Bible said he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. You can be walking in the bank, but you'll be in the wilderness. God knows the laws that he will subject your soul to. You may be in the bank and God tells you that in this bank, you will never take bribe. And many times you will have problem with your manager. But God is trying to create revival. You will be hated. You will be fought in that bank. But you will follow that law until it's complete. Witherness is not idleness. It is coming under government. Until God walks on your soul and purifies you. He said he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. Our generation is a generation that runs from process. We come for the fellowship, we look for vacuum, and then we want to take advantage of our natural charisma. Because the guy is a talker. He thinks he's supposed to succeed the next president. God is not looking for talkers. Because she has a good voice. She thinks she's supposed to lead the choir. God is not looking for good voice. If his good voice is looking for, the angelic realm would have sufficed. Have you heard an angel sing before? You will know you are playing here. What makes the difference between your worship and the angelic worship is that in you is the nature of God. So every time you lift your voice in worship, you are releasing incense that is the nature and the essence of God. And a man who God has not purified cannot release virtue. He cannot release the nature of God. We teach men to bring their shoulders so that God can put his body in. That's when there's hope for a generation. What burden are you carrying for the Lord? You cannot trigger a revival. You can never trigger a revival. You are smart with God. God comes this way, you go this way. God comes this way, you go this way. He will always give you bread and water, but you will never be relevant with Him. When you go to eternity, then you will discover that the reason you came into the world was to bet a process, but you never created it. Everything about John had one definition, to make the way for the Lord. What if he went back to eternity and he never did it? But how did John get to know it? It was in the pathway of process. He said, the one that appeared to me the same said unto me, Upon whomever the Spirit descends and rests is the Messiah. So John did not come baptizing because the, the Pharisees were sprinkling water on people. They called him John the Baptist because it was a new strategy, never existed. And the quality of his work was not the way it was because it was novel. It was the way it was because it was by instruction. It was by commandment. The reason he was baptizing was because it was a strategy of identifying Jesus. So he didn't come to do it because everybody is doing it. That was the only way he could recognize the Messiah. He walked in this thing until even his own eyes became open when he saw Jesus. Before baptism, he knew him. What we call growth is strange. We call growth the number of cars we have. Then spirits will come and they will be wondering. This guy is a prophet. He has not scratched one tenth of his prophetic calling. And he says he's made. The angels that work with you will stand like this. This guy is supposed to be a governor. 
Look at him selling clothes in a bar. He has not even noticed that this thing is on his life. Then the angels will look at you and shake their head. And then you go for a meeting, you do like this. And they say, who are you? They say, my name is Nathaniel. I'm studying biochemistry. I'm in 300 level. <laughs> they said to John, who are you? John invoked a prophecy that lasted for 700 years. Who told him he was the one? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. I am the voice. I am the voice. Who are you? Do you know the implication of saying you are the voice? If you say you are the voice, then they will say, where is the desire? Because the job description of the voice is to identify the desire. Even that one, he said, the one that sent me, the same said unto me, upon whomever the spirit descends. See how men walked on earth. See how men walked with God. And then you are living by trial and error. And you think you will be relevant. These were men without the Holy Spirit. See the degree of accuracy with which they walked. The girl is singing in church. She thought it's about position. So when they say new, there's a program. That's when she buys new high heels. Where's new we go? She sings. She's doing like this. And then she carries a very high pitch. <laughs> ah! Meanwhile, like I always say. Inside that girl's voice, there is something God planted. So that every time she lifts her voice to heaven, the angels that activate the gifts of the Spirit begin to walk. So every time that girl sings, a prophet is supposed to arise. A healing evangelist is supposed to arise. But she has been singing in church for 20 years. Not one gift has been activated. Because she thought it was about skill. So she sings the song, she tweaks it, she tweaks it. She bends her voice. She does the tongue, and they say, "Oh God, ha, Sarah, you gave voice." They say, "It's the grace of God." Meanwhile, every time she carries the microphone, all the angels are at last. They are waiting for her to touch him, so that they can begin to walk. But those angels have stood for twenty years. None of them have walked. Now, even when she's singing, they are relaxing. They know she can't touch him. The day revival begins. That day she may lose her voice because she was praying in tongue for 10 hours. But she comes to church as she said, Hallelujah. People begin to see in the spirit. People begin to see. People's hand, oil begins to flow. That day she has come alive in Zion. Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. 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 That day nobody may be excited, but somebody will leave that meeting. And then the person goes to the hostel and they say, Nathaniel is sick. And then suddenly faith moves in his spirit and says, Be healed. That faith that was stirred in his spirit, it was the voice of that girl that activated that faith because she had come alive. The guys enter the family. In their family for the past nine years, every two years, somebody dies. And today, for the first time, he enters the house. And then he just feels there's something by the door. He has never had that perception. But she attended this meeting where this girl was feeling. And his spiritual senses was activated. And he goes to the house. And then he shuts the voice of that altar. And death ends. Because a girl discovers her potential to the spirit. At every time she sings. She activates gifts. So for that girl, when she's coming for the crusade, others may be making their head. There's nothing wrong with it. She can make hers. But before she comes to that microphone, she will make sure that her spirit is saturated with the Holy Ghost. Even though she has a good voice, she understands that in the scales of the sanctuary, her value is not rated on the texture of her voice. Her value is now rated to the degree to which she can download it. So she will pray in tongues for five hours before she holds the microphone. She has understood priorities. Such people, they are named echo in heaven as popular citizens of Zion. Men walking on earth, but fulfilling purposes that were born in the heights of the heavens. Jesus said, He is come to do the will of the Father. 
So when you see Jesus, you see the Father. Jesus came to reveal God to humankind. Why are you here? Everything you pursue is legitimate. But it will not count unless you find out what God wants you to do. Because the day every one of us realize what we are born to do and begin to do it, that day the move of God begins. That's why God stares men up. Yours may be prayer. You think it's just to hide somewhere and pray. Oh, that prayer you are praying is generating energy for something else to happen on the altar. Yours may be business. You are skill for business. So you wake up, every, anything you touch begins to prosper. People can't see the business opportunity, you see it. And then you make all kinds of money. And when the church wants to go to TV and you are the one that sponsors it, you may not be praying, but what God put in your heart is the skill for business. Yours may be intelligent. You are in the lab 24 hours, discovering things, the driver. Yours may be on the political corridor. You know how to manipulate power. So you are the one that will pack the B that the church should become an institution. Reviver. This is not puppet we are talking about. This is the move of God. Because men have gone through the pathway of process and they have discovered who they were. When God appeared to me and told me he would make me an apostle to the nations, I was 12 years old. I thought that would happen the next day. <laughs> My training process took more than 13 years. The last, the last one that happened to me, sir, my friend, we were living together in the same house. We were in a two-bedroom apartment. He had one bedroom, I had another bedroom. Both of us were sons of Apostle Romeo's sir. A very good man. Till today, if I would point at somebody and say, this is my elder brother, he's the one. He was the one God used to chisel me. This guy runs a campus church. And when God began to separate me, I started going on periodic fast, 21 days fast, 21 days fast. I was running the schedule until I hit somewhere in the spirit. And then I saw him in a vision. And the word of wisdom that spoke to me in that vision was for me to join myself to him. So I came to his church. Before then, I was attending another church. I came to his church. After the first Sunday, second Sunday, I now walked to him and said, well, I think anything that you would have me do, I can just be here and serve. Both of us ministers in remnant. Both of us friends. Both of us living in the same house. You know what this guy did to me? The guy carried me by the hand like this and took me to the ushering unit and said, I should join the ushering unit. Me and you are ministers in remnant. We are friends. We are living in the same house. He said, I should join. And then he looked at me and said, Yeah, here, he likes people to grow through the ladder. Grow through his ladder. Me and you are starting up for far You are saying as you grow through the ladder in the campus so I had my master's degree. This guy was still a student. I came to church and then I only wore suits, double breasted suits. I will come to church, I will stand like this. They will now say, Hey brother, come. Then I will realize I was the one. And I will run and collect the offering basket. As I'm giving the offering basket, I'm in another world. Is this me? What's happening here? I don't know where to put my face. And then the worst part, they will have program and invite ministers or eminence who are my colleagues. And then when they come, see the way this guy is standing, I will stand like this. That was in 2017. <laughs> that was when I understood that there was a place that is deeper than doctrine. You think you are humble, you think you are broken, you think God wants to use you, you are a joker. I did that thing for one year, eight months. That was when God now touched his heart. Then I will come to church. Then I should sit with him in front. I wanted to say no. What do you mean sit between the front? After you have humiliated me, you now say, I would have failed the test again. As I wanted to utter it, the Holy Ghost moved in my soul. And I respected myself quickly. But a point came. As I did that thing for like six months, it became normal. I will be serving, I won't even notice how many. Sometimes they will organize a meeting, I will go and preach. Some of his brethren will attend. The power of God will scatter everywhere. They will come to church, they will say, sir, sir, sir. They will be so, is this you? Is you? 
Sometimes they will meet me, they meet me and say, Sir, we didn't know, we didn't know. Some people that you are giving them velvet, you know, you know how rude and arrogant students are. <laughs> One year, six months, God was purifying my soul. And it was my brother he used. This is a very good man. Loving and humble personality. But God moved in his heart. He said, put him in the ocean unit. I was there for one year, six months. Somebody says, seek him. It's called seek him. They teach him some body. They deal him some God. That's what creates fire. Eternal and everlasting in your soul. The pathway of process. That God brings you into in order to destroy the effect of the fall in your soul. Those places where the devil will come and place demand, God destroys that foundation. So when the devil comes, there is nothing to hold on to. So Jesus said, the prince of this world come to me and find it nothing. You know why? He went to John to be baptized. He said, suffer it to be so for now. Thus, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. How can creator go to be baptized of creation? Humiliation. You will call it. But God was teaching humankind the way to power, the way to spiritual authority, the way to move in the hand of God was for a man to come down and submit to the government of God. This is why we cry in church, God genuinely touch us. We fall under the anointing. But nothing about God lasts in our lives because the stability that God wants to create in our soul through process and dealing with it. So God wants to do something, pride we approach it. God wants to do something, lies we approach it. God wants to do something, masturbation we approach it. We keep crying periodically, but no results. It's because we violate the protocol of deal. Sikkim is a path that everyone follows. He said in Isaiah 51 verse 1 to 3, He said, hearken unto me, all ye that love righteousness, all ye that were hewn from the people. He said, look unto Abraham your father. And unto Sarah that bore thee, for I have called thee alone and blessed him. I have called him alone and blessed him and increased him. The path that Abraham followed is the path that all of us will follow. That is why even Jesus, the Son of God, when he came, he followed that path. The Holy Ghost drove him through pathways of dealing until the Bible said he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Your title will become nothing unless you subscribe to the school called Sikkim in the spirit. Where God places legitimate burdens on your shoulder so that he can chisel himself into your soul. Your prayer will have no power unless you have known the way of Sikkim. That's how God makes warriors. I told you, the idea is not just to create revival. The idea is to raise a clan of revivalists. And if we must be a clan of revivalists, all of us must pass through the pathway of TV. That's where your addictions will break. That's where your fears will break. That's where the hand of the devil upon your life will break. Nobody manifests overnight. I went through that school many times. And when God graduated me from there, he came to me and said, I will begin to announce you. And I released my messages. And in 14 days, my messages were in 17 nations. 17 nations of the world. In 14 days, I received four invitations in the U.S. What was I saying? It's the same thing I was saying for 13 years. But after process was complete, God now released the angels and they began to blow their shofar in the spirit. So when you say Jesus is Lord, people hear it and it echoes into their heart. Because your soul has become a conduit pipe that can steward the dimensions of God. Paul said, for that we loved you, we have not only communicated the gospel, but the substance of our soul. Hope you know when the leprous guys were going, their steps became like the sound of a chariot. When God deals with a man and he is refined, if that man speaks, the angels that walk with him echo it. They echo it through the earth. Did you read about Jesus? After he left the mountain of temptation, the Bible said his fame went abroad. That's why John could speak from the wilderness and the whole nation will go to him. There was a mystery in the spirit that was amplifying his voice. And every time he spoke, the angels gave it a thousand voice. So one man speaks, it becomes like the voice of many waters. 
you will carry the biggest speakers in your conference. And you will scream and speak in tongues and shout. Your message will remain on the shelf. Nobody will download it. Even if you pay and go to TBM. Apostles say the day you come and say hallelujah, nobody will tune in. Have you not noticed? Everybody's message is on Telegram now. Everybody is, on, is a Facebook apostle. Everybody is a Facebook evangelist. It is God that announces them. And until you yield to God, until he chases you, your soul cannot conduct his dimensions. Tonight, we are going to first of all make a commitment to God. Before we pray for the fire of God to rest on people. It's a very easy thing to release the fire of God. But it takes a lot of time to manage it. In Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12, he said the fire on the altar must not be put out. They put every morning. We can lift the song now and release fire. We can begin to pray and release fire. We can just start talking and allow our soul to ascend and release fire. But it will take a lifetime to, to steward it. And this is why I came to show you something. I came to reveal to you this evening that the path of dealing, the path of yieldedness, the path of obedience is the only channel through which God raises a revivalist. Paul said something. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, he said, We are servants of God, therefore we are stewards of the mysteries of Christ. That means access to mystery is not a function of study. You study to show yourself approved, but to gain access to mystery, you must become a servant of Christ. A part of dealing. Many of us live for ourselves. If we take a census, you'll be shocked that there are some people here that the Holy Ghost have been troubling for the past three months to pray every night. But because the authority of God is not, is not in their consciousness, they waste all their energy in the daytime. And when they go to sleep, they lie down like this and wake up by 9 a.m. And they say, it's not my fault. I wanted to wake up. If, if that consciousness is created, in the daytime, you know how to manage your energy. There are some people here that God has been instructing to take a fast, to take a fast, but the consciousness is not there. They think fasting is a spiritual exercise. They think it's a religious practice. You don't know that your destiny and your relevance in this world will anchor on the instruction that God gives you. For Noah, he said, build an ark. For Abraham, he said, get thee out of thy father's house. For Moses, he said, go to Pharaoh. If they had violated any of these instructions, they would never have been relevant. That instruction you think is a religious activity, that may be the only thing that will define your destiny. The glory and the beauty of your life, everything God can do with you and through you, may rest on that instruction that you have violated. Many of us are violators of instructions. Many programs, many crusades, many activities, but little obedience. This evening, I want us to make commitment. I have to keep it calm so that I'll be able to talk for this long. If I allowed my soul to ascend, by now, we would have been screaming and shouting. Thank God there are still many days for the conference. Perhaps you are here this evening. And there's that one instruction that God has been on in your life. One. You have not been able to obey. I came to tell you this evening that what will define your life is encapsulated in that instruction. You want your life to begin to have me. Come forward, let's pray together. And ask God for the release of grace. So that that thing that he has been echoing to you in your bed chamber that you thought was a religious instruction you will begin to commit your life to it today as if everything depends on it. And I tell you the truth, everything depends on it. Everything. It's only God that makes men in this kingdom. And over and over again, the Bible has revealed to us these patterns consistently. Ah, how I wish we will understand the urgency of this call. Like fire, 
Like the rain, let your glory fall. Like fire, like the rain, let it fall. Like fire, like the rain, let your glory take anything for this campus to bow before the cross of Jesus. It only takes men that are used. The authority of principalities is the ability to manipulate spiritual laws. And every time we violate spiritual laws, we give away our authority. That's why we preach there is no revival. We pray there is no revival. We worship there is no revival. Because there is disobedience in our constitution. Like fire, like the rain, let it fall. There's a prayer we are going to pray tonight before I speak over your life. When Paul met Jesus, he was walking in total rebellion. But the moment he encountered Jesus, he looked to the heavens. And he said, Lord, it is. And instantly, God began to speak his destiny into time. He said, it is hard for you to kick against the priest. Your destiny has already been written in Zion. But now that you are willing to obey, the great one can speak it into time. By the authority of the office of the Christos. He began to alter his destiny. Like we fire, give you glory. Like the rain, we bless your holy name for your love. Let your glory for your kindness. Fall. For your mercies. Like fire, it is for your mercy, Lord, that we are not consumed. Even as we congregate this morning to receive from the bounties of your spirit, we ask that you will look upon us as a people that hunger and thirst after righteousness and that you will stretch forth your hand and suffice every one of us according to your riches and glory bless us this morning lord beyond measure by the instrumentality of your word bring us light bring us wisdom and cause us to be carried on the wings of your spirit even to the very depths of life so that as we depart lord we will go with the essence, the fervor, and the energy of your realm to change our world for good. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. We give you praise. Take all the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. God bless you. This is a morning session. Let's keep it calm. <laughs> Let's keep it calm. Oftentimes, the temptation of swiftly tuning into the power of God is always there, especially when the hearts of people are open. But like we received the charge from the president, it's the word of the Lord that orchestrates a transformation in the hearts of men. And every generation that is bereaved of the revelation of the word of God is a lost generation. It doesn't matter the move of the spirit or the dimensions they walk in. The word of God is the boundary of preservation for a generation. And the heritage of God is communicated to a generation through the instrumentality of his word. And so this morning, we'll be trusting the Lord to instruct us in his ways. So that the least one among us will become as strong as David. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Today, your conference is tagged the holy mountains. This morning, we are going to look at the definition of terms. It's um, by evening that I will look deeper into the dynamics of the tag for this conference. I will just 
take for granted that everybody knows what we are here for and on the strength of that bring some very quick definitions and then we'll go home and prepare our spirits for the evening service the evening service will be an impartation service uh, you know there are lots of things that we can communicate cognitively but when you interact with spirits is the experience of their reality that translates to relevance so if you don't touch the essence and the reality of a spirit Everything you know is just um, a cliche, and you may be very bold and proud about what you say. It will not translate to any difference on the landscape. So in the evening, we'll see how, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we will be communicating knowledge as a body of spirits. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, we'll look at the concept, and then we'll look at how we can journey into the place of the holy mountains in the spirit and then we'll look at the operations that characterizes the holy mountain we'll try to see what the holy mountain is how to journey to the holy mountains of god and then the operations of the spirit that characterizes the holy mountains you know it's important for you to understand certain concepts in the kingdom because if you don't understand them you may waste your life Thinking you are pleasing the Lord in the many activities that you do. If you don't understand very fundamental concepts in your dealings in the kingdom of God, you will waste your life. The walk with God is the walk of faith. But if that walk is not couched in understanding, it becomes a risk. Because you may journey to the end of the tunnel and discover you walked in the wrong direction and you wasted your life. We are in a generation where everything that is spiritual is characterized as an emotional operation. So a lot of people are deceived thinking because the emotional frequency is heightened and they have some experiences and the bask in the euphoria of the atmosphere, they feel it translates directly to spirituality. Yes, spirituality impacts the emotion. But it is not an economy that runs on the frequency of your emotions. The pillars and the blocks upon which the strength of your work with God is built must be well defined. And the very facts of spirit realities must be very well defined before whatever you do can translate to meaning. Else you'll be taking a risk that you have not very well quantified. You see, spirits are not men. Their ways are different. So it's important for you not to walk with spirit on the strength of assumptions. Your assumptions may look very logical and intelligent, but that they are intelligent does not mean they are spiritual. For example, men consider love as affection. And love is demonstrated by the exchange of affections. And on the strength of our affection, we can even furnish it with gifts. But spirits have nothing to do with affection when they talk about love. When you deal with spirit, love is obedience. So that will reveal to you how words are part. The operations of men and spirit are. Your affection may become the greatest definition of your love. But for a spirit, the degree to which you love him is the degree to which you obey him. So Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because he is talking from a height in Zion that only the spiritual can discern. That's why he said the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit of God. Because first of all, they are foolishness unto him. He said, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That it sounds logical does not make it spiritual. What makes it spiritual? is the substance of life that is furnished from the holy ghost himself and everything that is void of the impartation of the holy spirit has no place in eternity you may carry it out with all your power but it will not strike a chord where it matters and even spiritual activities like prayer are useless if they are not couched in the realm of the spirit the name of jesus is useless if it is not demonstrated or released in the spirit your praise and your worship is useless if it is not conducted in the spirit what makes the difference 
is the realm from whence you are speaking and the one who furnishes the utterance that is why a lot of people run into all kinds of contradictions because the faith preacher comes to them and say if you say in the name of jesus the mountains will move but have you not checked that you have said the name of jesus for many years and your mountains are becoming bigger sometimes we go to god in our contradiction and we we honestly tell the lord we believe and truthfully we believe sometimes we can even risk our lives because we know we believe but why is there no difference because we don't understand that spiritual economies do not run on their reasonability they run on the strength of their spirituality and spirituality is a reality that is furnished by the holy ghost himself and carried out in the spirit the bible said in john chapter 4 verse 24 he said they that worship must worship the father in spirit and in truth you know preachers have interpreted that scripture to be worship in tongues it's not tongues if you look at the original translation it means to worship the father you must enter into the spirit and worship in the spirit that is the literal translation but very few understand the way to the spirit so we carry out spiritual activities in the flesh everything that is flesh is corruption if the name of jesus is altered in the flesh it's corruption if the word of god is quoted or ministered in the flesh it's corruption what animates the word and brings it to life is the spirit that is why the life of jesus is constantly characterized by spirit based operation jesus was the son of god full of authority but he did nothing in his authority the bible said in luke 4 14 that he returned in the power of the spirit in acts of the apostles chapter 1 verse 2 the bible said after that he had given commandment to the apostles by the spirit even the ministrations of jesus were in the spirit that's why he said in john 6 63 that the words i speak they are not intelligent words they are spirit and they are life so when jesus comes to you his goal is not to alter something that is novel his goal is to alter a word that is coming from the womb of the spirit you see the revival that is coming is going to be activated by the utterance of the spirit but because utterance have become the catalyst that the holy ghost wants to use for this revival a lot of people are out preaching the gospel in verbosious and very articulate english language it is not a function of english language utterance is a word that is energized by the holy ghost a word that is better from the womb of the spirit that is why when you hear a word that is an utterance it stirs hunger in your spirit it empowers your spirit and it quickens you to enter into the spirit everything jesus did was in the spirit a lot of people are sick and then they keep quoting by his stripes i'm healed i heard a strange word from benihim that shook the foundations of my faith he said that you it's in the bible does not mean it is yours you lay hold on it in the spirit before it is yours <laughs> people are quoting by his tribes they are healed and they die because they are quoting it in the flesh it's not real to them but they believe that by saying it over and over or getting emotional about it sometimes we even begin to cry and we shut down our reasoning and then we are nodding our head <laughs> that you say it quick does not energize it until it becomes real and it can only be real in the spirit even the sacrifice of jesus having satisfied the claims of divine justice was not accepted the bible said in hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 that he after the eternal spirit it was offered he offered himself up by the eternal spirit jesus understood that without the holy ghost there is no reality that can be animated everything done outside the womb of the spirit has one name it's god flesh and the destination is corruption many christians don't know anything about the spirit when we speak about the holy mountains we are talking about the womb of the spirit we are not talking about a heat up we are talking about the place of the presence where the holy ghost and his reality have a
absolute authority for operation there are few christians there we are many in church but there are few in the spirit and that is why we talk a lot but very little happen we boast in the name of jesus but our life is a statement of a contradiction of the things that form the canons of our faith a man speaks so boldly about healing yet he's bastardized with sickness a man screams so much about the power of the holy spirit yes his life is 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 a, is, is, is a charade his life is a definition of waste a man speaks so much about righteousness but is a puppet in the hands of spirit every day of his life he lives in secret sins so there is a confusion in his life the things he believed and the things he has as his present our reality are worlds apart he cannot understand why the things he believes cannot become his reality the difference is the spirit until a man understands how to journey into the spirit his walk with god have not begun i want to show you this morning because the holy mountain is the presence is the presence it's not a huge talk he said in hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 he said thou have come to mount zion the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem it's not a scripture to quote it's an experiential location in the spirit and everyone who is supposed to be numbered among the saints should have a place in that experiential spiritual location if you have not come to that spot every activity you carry out in time will not appear in the radars of zion you know when you are at the airport the way you dictate the plane is that you check the dot the light appears like a dot in the radar if you can't see it in the radar it's not there even if it's coming there could be an accident in the airspace because it is not highlighted in the radar until you have come into the spirit what you are doing is not highlighted you may be living worship and you have a golden voice and you are singing and you are crying what is happening is that the melody is the one touching your emotional cord when you enter the spirit the spirit will come alive and i just want to be where you are dwelling daily in your presence i don't want to worship from afar draw me near to where you are i just want to be where you are in your dwelling place forever take me through the place where you are i just want to be with you some years ago i listened to bishop david oedepo i heard his messages i could repeat and recite the whole messages i scored his messages i quoted the scriptures he quoted with the same kind of intensity but nothing was happening lord what is wrong i collided with apostle romeo sir i will hear the man of god for eight hours i came out those days if i cough you think it's apostle Arume every phrase every sentence his gesticulations everything but i will not have the experience when i'm talking people will be clapping and laughing ah, this guy can speak english meanwhile if apostle speaks people weep there's hunger in their spirit i say what where is this thing coming from i mastered the ways in the mind i was a man of the flesh i didn't understand that this man spoke from the ambience of the presence they were talkers from heaven they were not people that speak on earth jesus said the son of man which is in heaven he was walking in the streets of Kaledi when he made the statement he understood that nothing will move because he's the son of god everything will move because he is in the spirit he made the spirit realm his hiding place the man will live a crusade very tired and you will hear jesus run to the mountain sometimes the bible will said he will drive everybody away including his disciples enter the ship and go to the other side why did he pursue the spirit so much that was his secret 
You know, people say prayer is the secret. Prayer is not the secret. Muslims pray and some pray more than you. The Hindus pray and most of them pray far much more than you do. The difference is the presence. If the presence of the Holy Spirit is not a cardinal part of what you are doing, you are only exercising yourself in the flesh. The difference between your prayer and the prayer of the Muslim man is the Spirit of God. Not that you call the name of Jesus. Because even demons call the name of Jesus. Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are thou? So the name of Jesus is not what makes the difference. It's the spirit in the name that makes the difference. Hope you remember Jesus was called Jesus from the day he was born. But the Bible said after the sacrifice of alignment was satisfied. The claims of divine justice was met. And he said the Lord gave him a name that is above every other name. Something was added to the name of Jesus. It is the authority of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one that animates the dimensions of God. You can hear a message of a man and quote it. People may call you names and you become famous. You will have no impact on the landscape. You will be in a church and you will be sleeping with the people in the choir. And all kinds of wardom will be going on. Even if you are righteous, you will not be able to alter anything in their lives. They will hear you every day, but they will live in perpetual sin. Because what makes the difference is the animation of the spirit. Before you begin to bother yourself to know so much, because there are many people saying a lot of things, learn the way of the spirit first. When you know the Holy Ghost, he solves the problem. You know, people try to stand on pulpits and say a lot of things. If God begins to announce you, you'll be tired of preaching. From Monday till now, this is my eighth ministration. And as I'm rounding up from here tomorrow, I'll be in Joss for another three sessions before Sunday night. Preaching is not the focus. It's the Holy Ghost. The Holy Mountain is the womb of the Spirit. It's the place of the presence. Many don't know it. It will take a lot of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit to get there. And that leads me to talk about how to get to the presence. You don't get to the presence because you are born again. No, sir. We are all born again, but most of us are in the flesh. Legally, you have the right to the presence, but experientially, many are far. I want to keep it calm this morning to instruct you. So that you know what to begin to do consciously. Because most of us have become famous as choir heads. The whole campus, they know you. If they say worship, ah, if any big man of God is coming, you are the one. And that you heard a song, and the song you hear is so much and it's playing in your mind does not mean you are in the spirit. Your soul is a processor. So anything you hear over time, your soul begins to repeat it. They say there's a crusade that the Kumuye is coming, you are the one. Bishop David Oedepo is coming, you are the one. Apostle Roman is coming. You are the one. That doesn't mean you are a spiritual person. You could be a very talented lady. And that you know how to exhort people. You pick this scripture, pick this scripture, pick this scripture. And then you phrase it in very intelligent utterance. It doesn't mean you are spiritual. You must be a man of the presence. To stand in the holy mountains of God. And it takes so much to get there. It takes so much, my brother, to get there. Very few find it in this life. Very few Christians walk in the presence. Very few. What do you do to get to the presence? The first thing you need to know is that the presence is not something you get to by your zeal. It is revealed. It's revealed. And you are carried. <laughs> I know a lot of people, you know, I come from a place of prayer. So, most of the things we study, see, we have seen the practicals. We have seen, we've seen the practicals of most of the things we study. 
There are times when we go to pray in tongues and we, we gauge ourselves at different hours. What will happen if I pray in tongues straight for three hours, for six hours, for nine hours, for 12 hours, for 15 hours, for 18 hours? What will be the impact? These are, they are the way you go and play football and you are learning leg over. That's how we exercise ourselves. We are a people of prayer. Where I come from. My friend Victor Obe, he can begin to pray very loud like this. And he'll be walking like this for 18 hours. <laughs> it's not under your breath. Very in high intensity. And he'll be moving like this for 18 hours. Sometimes we go for VG. <laughs> you know when we're in the flesh. You know you can be so much in the flesh in the place of prayer. If the Holy Ghost is not at work. <laughs> you don't understand. When you experiment these things, you understand. You will humble yourself first. Because you know you are a man of the flesh. Go for vigil and then vigil is 10. <laughs> I will not call anybody's name for this one. I don't know who hear the message. Come by 6 p.m. and then begins to blast in tongue. People around, maybe they will go and bath, come back. Some will go and eat. When it's 10, people are coming for vigil. That's when the guys are adding gear. When the VG finished by three, the guy is, is that time he's on gear five. Then you see even the movement that time because his body, something else is at work in him. Then you go for the VG, you go and sleep and wake up around 10 in the morning. Then you are still hearing the voice. You come back. After the VG, you come and give him seed. Say, take, take. Something. There is something at work in your life. Because you know that it is not within the regions of mortality to exert such capacity. It must have to be by the technology of a spirit working within him. And then most people see the guy flowing at that level of grace. And then when they come for prayer, they want to match. Then when they are praying, oh, 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 it's a man running a rat race. What he's doing is competition. is of the flesh. And some can go like that for six hours. And they will maintain that schedule for months. That's why prayer is not spirituality. It's a walk with the spirit. The herbalist is more spiritual than most of us. The herbalist. He understands the ways of his spirit. The spirit he walks with. He knows the things that pleases him. He knows what to do for the realm to open for him. He knows what to do to manipulate the protocols of the realm. But you who is a Christian. Everything that, behold, that attacks you or challenges you. You are lost. That is because the technology of the spirit is not at work. Even the voice of God cannot be heard unless in the spirit. That's why most of us walk by assumption. You say, I hear God when they are giving an open ended word of knowledge. They come and uh, God is saying that uh, in this month, um, he, he wants us to pray. There's a burden for prayer. Uh, let's pray because God wants to do something. They just look at what is happening and bring assumption and say it's the voice of God. Then when they want to marry, the person that has, that has the voice of God that speaks to the whole fellowship, now she wants to marry. And then she doesn't know who God is saying. <laughs> and fellowship, when the power of God is moving, ooh, ooh, ah, that's it, the Lord, that's it, the Lord. But when there is a real challenge, say, what do you think about this? This one is one or two. It's not an open-ended word of knowledge. Then you discover that um, the voice of God is scarce. Because there are few that know the path to the spirit. I can come here and start talking and in 10 minutes everybody is crying. Screaming and falling everywhere. But I came to realize it doesn't change people. The tangibility of your understanding is your security in your work with God. If you don't have a definite understanding and apply your life to it, you have taken a very terrible risk. Very terrible risk. And many Christians are living a life of great risk. There are most in crisis today. They go and cry before God. And they have cried like that for six months. Nothing is happening. Won't you come back and say, come, wait. How does this thing work? How, wait. How does this thing work? Because at first you thought crying makes a difference. You have cried for days. And the cancer is growing. The kidney infection is increasing. How does this thing work? People deceive themselves a lot. And they think they please God. 
how do you journey into the presence first is that what it is revealed and you are carried the psalmist said quicken us O lord that we may call upon your name so the prayers that strike a chord in the realm of the spirit is a prayer that comes by the quickening of the holy ghost quicken us quicken us they are not shouting in tongues and why they are speaking in tongues when everybody's voice go down then they announce okay at least this people gonna say we know be equal we know be mate <laughs> that's somebody who is praying no? <laughs> they were speaking in tongues bo, 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 bo. many people were shouting so he was there when everybody got tired he now said okay at least now they will know we are not equals that's the man who have been praying in tongues for three hours he said he's in the flesh he's not quickened quicken us that we may call upon your name <laughs> ah I wish Christians would just settle down and learn basic things. Basic. Learn basic things and just begin to apply it every day. Your life will change radically. Radically. I know a lot of people who won't got to talk things, bogus things about. If we could settle down. You know, this is the morning session. So, in the evening I will not be like this. In the evening I will actually come with a garment of fire. That one, let me tell you ahead of time. I will come in the fullness of a revivalist. But this morning, I need to share some things with you because I may not have the opportunity again. Some of you think prayer is spirituality. So you pray in the flesh for many years. It doesn't make a difference. And that brings me to the second thing. To be carried, you must be surrendered. When you pray, the first thing you do in the place of prayer is to surrender. Else you will pray in the flesh for a long time and you will strengthen your will. That's why the hardest people for God to talk to are those who pray. They believe they hear God. And you look at most of them, they are walking in error. But they can never hear. The hardest people to counsel are the people that say they are spiritual. The journey into the spirit is the journey of surrender. Because in this mountain you will be carried there. You labor in the flesh. The Bible said the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them. Because they know not to enter the city. The reason your process takes long is not because process lasts for 10 years. It's not because process lasts for 15 years. And it's not because process lasts for 3 years. There's no formula to it. It is when you yield that your process ends. When you learn the way of surrender, that's when your process ends. The journey through the wilderness was supposed to be for 11 days. It lasted for 40 years because the people will not bend their neck. The Bible said they were a people of a stiff neck. So wilderness is not the idea of God. Wilderness is a product of rebellion. To be taught the ways of the spirit. They do not notice that everybody that went to the wilderness, the whole generation perished. Because they had an evil heart. It was only Caleb and Joshua that came out. Every other person that made it was born there. They didn't know the ways of Egypt. See, Christian, bitterness, bitterness. Process is not time based, process is obedience based. If you are not yielded, your own process will be 20 years. So don't bring your process as a doctrine. I don't want to hear it. Because what God is using you to do, somebody else was used for six months. But in Nigeria here, because of our arrogance, most times it takes an average of 10 years. <laughs> because the guy will not hear. He will never hear. He will never hear. He wants to move in power. <laughs> Come for a meeting. The Holy Ghost say, calm down. Tell the people about my love. But everybody heard of him. They came. How will they come? And then he will not move in power. And then, Holy Ghost, move, move. Then Satan is wise. He will inspire a lot of things to happen. And then one or two people fall down. And they are shaking everywhere. And they say he's an apostle of power. Well, the last time I read the Bible, power is not a product of people falling down. There are threefold operations of power. One is deliverance from the, de the power of the devil. Two is healing. Three is walking of miracles. Four is faith. 
So that your meeting that 30 people fell down, how many people were healed of tangible infirmities? How many were delivered from the powers of the devil? And many months we came back and we say, this one was an immoral person, but now she's burning because the transforming power went into that person and broke the cords of darkness. Rebellious generation. We are so arrogant. Because there are books available online, messages online. We read this message, hear this one, and then we come to say it. And then you see a 10 year, a 10 year old boy come on Facebook and is challenging Benny. <laughs> you think spirituality is about knowledge, it's about experience. How much of God have you experienced? <laughs> hey, hey, that thing Bishop Wedek will say, it's wrong. How can he say that? Come on, come on. We respect these people, but come on, man. Come on, man. And this guy has never even read the Bible. He doesn't even have the discipline to sit down and read the Bible. He heard one quote from one man, heard another quote from another man. <laughs> we need to be helped. <laughs> we need to be helped. That's why the way of surrender is scarce. It's difficult in our time. There are many who don't know how to surrender. The Holy Ghost, we hold them on the neck. Oh, not he can't walk. You can't be relevant with God. Because relevance is not even a function of what you are doing on earth. What you are doing on earth could be by the agency of a devil. They came to him. They said, we walk miracles in your name. He said, away from me, walkers of iniquity. So the devil can help you to carry out miracles. They are called lying wonders. Even what you call casting out devils, there is exorcism. Where demons can cooperate with themselves <laughs> to deceive you and make you feel you are healing a, a deliverance minister. So you came, you say, get out. The demon will tell, just go, just go. Meanwhile, he has bound you in perpetual immorality. So you are living immorality to say, but I'm casting out devils. Come on, the anointing is working. You don't know that demons are cooperating to put you in bondage so that you will never amount to anything in God. The way of surrender. For you to be popular among the immortals. On earth you must be completely broken. <laughs> he said as a prince thou have power with God. And have prevailed. How did he become a prince? Not because he was a custodian of the Abrahamic blessing. He became a prince because he was broken. The guy was blessed before he left the house. But when he encountered the angel of the Lord. They wrestled all night. When his flesh was dealt with, he now realized that even though the blessing legally, legally was already spoken over him, he had no apprehension of it. He now said, I won't let you go until you bless me. That's why most of us have power. will never manifest it. And the angel touched his tie bow and broke it. That was from the day the man leaned on his staff. He needed a support. The day he began to lean on a support and his confidence moved from himself, that day, in heaven he became a prince his coronation came on the strength of his brokenness as a prince thou hast power with God and have prevailed is the journey into the spirit realm is the journey of surrender you know that you are born again doesn't mean you are there the only thing that was revealed to you when you got born again was the resurrected Jesus so it's the revelation of the resurrection that implants immortality in your spirit. That's why at salvation, you were not asked to go and repent from all your sins. They just told you to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that was what you confessed. That means you believe that in Jesus there is power over death. And on the strength of your faith in the immortality of Jesus, the same economy is communicated into your spirit. The reason most times you go for crusade and they say, come and rededicate your life is because at salvation, you actually carried out two confessions. The first confession you carried out was the confession of the immortality of Jesus. That's the resurrection. The second confession is the confession of the lordship of Jesus. One is once and for all. The other, you will repeat it many times. Because in the area of, every area of disobedience, when you realize the lordship of Jesus, you confess him again and then you surrender again. The day you got born again, immortality was planted in your spirit, but your soul was rebellious. So as you go, the Holy Ghost says, don't lie again. Then you say, Lord. You go and say, don't fornicate again. You say, Lord. You go and say, don't steal again. You say, Lord. You go and say, begin to fast and pray. You say, Lord. So the confession of the Lordship is perpetual. 
That's why repentance is after remission of sin. Every time you bow again from your old way, you are confessing the Lordship of Jesus. It's a journey of continuous surrender because there will be a progressive instruction of the Holy Ghost coming in your direction if you are healthy in the spirit. Unless you are not healthy. If you are healthy, you will keep hearing. The Bible said, Daring is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So as you go deeper in the kingdom, you will receive new laws. Maybe the day you give your heart to Christ, eating in the morning is not a crime. But now God is confirming responsibility on you. So it will be a sin for you to eat. That is not a doctrine. It's organic life. It's relationship. That's why Samuel say, I will not sin against the Lord by not praying for you. For Samuel, if he doesn't pray for Israel, it's a sin. Because therein is the righteousness of God revealed. There is the general righteousness of God and there is an ordination based righteousness. Because you are a prophet, God will tell you you will pray every night. For you to be accurate with God, you must pray every night. That one is so that the weight of your calling can manifest. Is the journey of surrender. The journey of surrender. Many don't know it. That's why we are arrogant. But when you find it, you become a prince. You pursue men of God, you think that's the way. It's a lie. The best thing a man of God has to give you is the precepts of God. Even if he gives you everything God has given him, you will not walk in it until you bow to the precepts of God. If you have not learned the way of obedience, you can't walk in it. That was why Paul lived with Timothy. He anointed him. The presbytery laid hands on him. But he told him to fan it to flame. He gave him instructions to bring those things to pass. The whole presbytery that represented the government of the church in their day. They laid hands on Timothy because it was obvious that everything God had in mind. Timothy was the one to carry out that heritage to the next generation. It was not in doubt that he was the lead among every other young person rising. At the age of 17, he was ordained a bishop of Ephesus. Hands were laid on him, gifts were imparted. But it will never manifest until he learns the path of surrender. The journey of surrender is the journey into kingdom relevance. But very few find it. As a prince, thou hast power with God. The revelation you received on salvation is the revelation of the resurrected Christ. If that is all you have, you will never walk in the presence. My best teacher in this topic is Benihim. Oh, bless Benihim. He will use the tabernacle to illustrate the journey of the presence. The journey. The Holy Ghost reveals Jesus for you. You give your heart to Christ. Then the next thing you meet in the tabernacle is the altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice, sacrifice reveals the cross. The cross speaks only one language. Death. Death to flesh. Everything that is of the old creation, the cure to it is the cross. The old creation can never journey into God. It must pass through a junction in the spirit called the cross. It's when the old creation journeys into the cross that a new man is born. It's the cross that places a continuous demand on the flesh to die. And if you carry the garbage of flesh, you cannot travel deep enough to touch the presence. When the revelation of the cross comes to you, it is twofold. The first fold shows you the dimensions of iniquity and the possibilities of the fall. So it orchestrates repentance in your spirit. A man who has not been given the revelation of the cross doesn't repent. Most of the things we call repentance is in the flesh. That's why we are telling God that we will not lie again. The next person you speak to, you lie. You are telling God that we will not fornicate again. The next time you visit the boy, you fornicate. Because you confessed in the flesh. There is no repentance in the flesh. Repentance is an economy that is only operational in the spirit. And that happens when you are convicted. It is when the revelation of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is revealed to you. That conviction can come into your spirit. And until a man is convicted, he can't repent. That's why most of us live in sin perpetually. Because when you re repent, the power of sin is broken. But it comes when the revelation of the cross is given to you. Do you see why we depend on God every day? Because in this kingdom, you don't have any way to shine. Anything called shining is in Christ. You can't shine in this kingdom. The realm is designed such that you can never take credit for anything. 
so we latch on to the holy spirit we are fasting and praying the goal is not to fast for 10 hours for 21 days the goal is not to pray in tongues for 15 hours the goal is to apprehend the holy ghost what is what are you saying if he has not spoken for three days the prayer continues because the target is not time it's good to pray for long it exercises your spirit but the focus is the spirit himself you are there until he speaks you hold on to him because if the holy ghost does not reveal the cross the preacher may quote all the scriptures about the cross you may memorize it and quote it but you may still be living in sin and quoting by his stripes i'm healed the chastisement of my peace was upon him but you are thinking about immorality in your heart because you are a being you are not a puppet if you were a puppet or a robot we could program you with instructions but you are a being so you flow by life and until the holy ghost reveals reality to your spirit life cannot flow it is the revelation of the cross this is the journey into the presence many don't have it because they are too full of themselves when you surrender to the holy ghost then he begins to show you the protocol of the mountain he said who shall come to the mountain of god who shall stand upon his holy hills him that have not lifted off his heart in vanity whose hand is of a clean hand and a pure heart how do you make your heart pure what economy has the power to make your heart pure you can choose to become a monk today don't go out again don't look at a woman and meditate for 15 years you will still be iniquitous because what is affecting you is first of all in nature before it is an act and only the holy spirit sustains the power to join into the nature and reconfigures it because it was by him that you were designed is the revelation of the cross you see why in christianity our root is deeper than the tree we travel deep on the ground before we manifest <laughs> if you jump up and begin to shout you have no root even satan will leave you first when you become popular then he will shoot you and then you become a public ridicule to the name of god and the body of christ don't rush to shout allow the holy ghost announce you because the holy ghost announced finished products have you seen a company <laughs> oh my goodness the revelation of the cross it deals with the flesh and when the holy ghost is done with that then it carries you to the liver it is in the liver that the holy ghost is rubbed into you he washes you he purges you he renews you that's when oneness and intimacy begins you know most of us that follow the instruction of the holy ghost don't do this don't do this and we are looking at him for help sometimes you do that thing until you are tired you have, you have you don't enjoy intimacy yet because intimacy is not a protocol that happens when you are obeying in obedience you cry because the flesh is being judged when you begin to satisfy the demands of surrender then the holy ghost begins to allow the texture of his reality to rub off on you that's when god gives you an instruction you are happy eh? they say empty your pocket and give us an offering and then you say thank god how do you imagine that the apostles were beaten and flogged and they came back giving glory to the lord that they were counted worthy to be flogged in the name of jesus see something have happened to the flesh priorities have changed ambitions have changed value systems have changed because their nature has been altered when you want to kill them they will look at you and say please when you crucify me don't face my head up because my lord was faced up face me down <laughs> Is the walking of the cross. Now they say, Hey, God say, Go to Meduguri. Say, hey, hey. No, I didn't hear God. Meduguri. <laughs> they have not seen the cross. So you are still living for yourself. You still have ambitions that you carry like an egg and you preserve it with all your life. Say, Marry this man. Say, okay, This man. The person I want to marry is tall and fair. Mm -mm, it can't be this man. God will speak again. <laughs> you cannot be popular among the mortars. The way of the cross he deals with the flesh and when you satisfy that claim of obedience then you begin to sense the holy spirit that's when you go to the place of prayer and prayer becomes sweet others are checking the time to pray for four hours you are there you say holy father and the next time you open your eyes in the night meanwhile you knelt down around 8 a.m what has happened the holy ghost is rubbing into you 
is rubbing, is rubbing into you. That's where you are purged. Your proclivities are beginning to wash away. You know, before you enter the Holy of Holies, all of these things must happen to you. The flesh must die because it's not a place where you transact on the strength of flesh. You must be sanctified because him, the Bible said, Thou, O God, art of a purer eyes. Your eyes cannot behold iniquity. So you must be washed by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is not a function of rules. It is intimacy with God. He washes you off. Jesus said, the words I have spoken, they've washed you. By what means? Because the words I speak, they are spirit, they are life. It is the systems of the liver. And when you enter into the, the inner court, the menorah is there. And then the altar of shoe bread is there. And then the altar of incense is ahead of you. When you interact with these three things, you can enter the presence. Do you see that the presence is more difficult than the move of power? That's why most people move in power in disobedience. Have you not come to that point where you do what you want to do and you know it's not the will of God? Then you go back and you are crying. Hey, God, forgive me. God, for you were moving in power. When you want to move in the presence, you must have perfect obedience. The gate is the revelation of the resurrected Christ. The, the, the altar of sacrifice is the revelation of the cross. The lava is the revelation of the sanctification or the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. The altar of shoe bread is the revelation of the word. That's when you open scriptures, it becomes sweet. You can sit down and hear messages for 10 hours. What is happening? You want to eat, you can't stand up. The thing is sweet. In Jeremiah 15, 16, you say, I found thy word. I did eat them and they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Suddenly you read the scriptures, you, you, you are digging, you are digging a good mind. You are digging. It's not that every morning I will read five scriptures. It's good. Discipline is good. Because before you get to that point where the Holy Ghost can hang you up, you need discipline to keep up. Because if you allow your system open and porous, the devil will take advantage. And if you get distracted, you are gone. If you don't make reading of the Bible a habit or prayer a lifestyle, Facebook will replace it. And from Facebook, you, it will become pornography. And from pornography, it will become three boyfriends. And then it will become abortion. And it will become death. So discipline is good. We don't talk down on discipline. But we are telling you that beyond rules is an organic life. Because the children of Israel obeyed these rules for 1,500 years. There was no life. The systems... Of the presence. The presence. At the altar of shoe bread, the word of God is revealed. You know the word of God. That's when you don't just come because you use the concordance to gather the scriptures accordingly and then you are quoting it the way you crammed it. No. When you are flowing, the word of God will flow out of you like a river. I had my message there, but as I'm standing here, I'm flowing by inspiration. The things I'm telling you, I didn't premeditate it. You have interacted with the word of God. The Holy Ghost has brought you to the altar of shoe bread. The word has become real. That's when the ideologies of your ancestors will no longer have authority over you. Let me tell you something. You can still be a Christian and be a slave of spiritual patterns. Spiritual altars are dealt with by the cross. But spiritual patterns will continue. Because spiritual patterns are programs that are facilitated by rebellious spirits. So even though... Force is not supposed to be part of you. Sickness is not supposed to be part of you. A demon can force it. So there is no legal base in the spirit. But because they are rebellious, they will keep doing it until you fight them out. That's why when we go to cast out devils, we just command them. Because we know they don't have any legal basis. Hope you know demons were not casted out in the Old Testament. There were legal grounds. At best, you exercise them and use songs and sounds to to, to, to draw their attention away. But in the New Testament, there's no legal ground. So we rebuke them. We cast them out. But if you don't have the revelation of the word of God in your spirit, demons will still play over your life. So the system of the presence is the system of absolute dominion in the world. It brings you into absolute dominion. The word of God becomes real. The gate reveals the resurrected Christ. The altar of sacrifice reveals the cross. The lava reveals the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. The altar of shoe bread reveals the word of the Lord. And then the menorah 
he reveals to you the mind of God, the will of God for your life. That's when, at first you join the fellowship, you love singing. But now you have a personal walk with God and suddenly you begin to know that you are a, you are a prophet. So the sounds you are hearing is not just to sing. Those sounds, they are transport system. So suddenly when you hear sound now, you are not in a rush to write a song and go and sing in the church. If you start hearing sound, you step back and you shut the door. You know an encounter is coming. Because the sound comes to suck you into the spirit realm. And every time you follow that sound, suddenly an angel appears. Then you now realize that, oh, the will of God for me is a prophet. Oh, <laughs> if I pastor, you understand what I'm saying. 90% of people that meet you, they'll say, what does God want me to do? They don't have a relationship with him. If they begin to practice the presence, questions of callings are not questions to ask. Did you read anywhere in the Bible where the Bible says God told the disciples that they will be apostles? Suddenly in Acts chapter 2, they began to introduce themselves as apostles. What happened? They have journeyed far enough to discover who they were. Where did you read in the Bible? <laughs> it was in the Old Testament that God will say, I'm making you a prophet. In the New Testament, we walk into it. We walk and then we find ourselves. Ah, I'm not an evangelist. I'm a leader. My place is in the government. So as I'm walking my way through the government, I know I'm a witness of Zion. Because I have journeyed to the menorah. I know the mind of God concerning my life. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. He didn't say, I know the words I wrote concerning you. If you don't journey until the illuminated dimension of the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you can't find and factor the mind of God for you. And hope you know that your calling and your destiny is peculiar to you. You will not find it by reading the Bible. It's not there. They didn't say Titus is a prophet. Or Timothy is an apostle. It's not written there. That one, you'll find it if you journey to the point of the menorah. Then the Lord reveals to you, this is my mind towards you. You will even journey until God will say, your right hand has been anointed with power. Anytime you sense the hand vibrating in the meeting, lift it, the healing anointing is there. So you can come for a healing service and you are playing. You are just you are Somebody else who does not know, he will need to open every scripture that talks about healing to build the faith of the people. But you, you come for healing service, you'll just be playing or you'll be worshipping. When your right hand begins to move, you don't need their faith. The power for healing has come. You know what is at work. It's organic life. I went for Benny Hinn's conference. They were just worshipping. He was teaching. He finished teaching. He started worshipping. He said, the power has not hit the building. The man knew when the, that second, when the power comes. And instantly begins to command demons. And you see people rising from witches. He said at one point in Ohio, he went for a crusade. He just walked into the building and 43 cripples rose from which year? 40, not one, not two, 43 cripples rose from which year? He, he was so saturated with who he was. He knew it. You know, sometimes we are motivated. So when five people tell you you are an apostle, they now come and tell you three prophets have confirmed it. But there is no knowing on their inside. Even if the whole prophet in the world gather together in one stadium and say, you are an apostle, you will not walk in it until it is illuminated in your spirit by the menorah. It's the journey of the presence. That's how you come to the holy mountains where you wield the powers of God. There are few that can wield the hand of God because very few of us travel in the spirit. The illuminating powers of the spirit. By the time you get to that point, that's when you can worship God. You know, worship is not singing. Singing helps your soul to align. But worship is actually the transference of the substance of glory on your inside to God. Everything God puts in you that makes his essence real to you, you surrender it back to him. That's why sometimes in the place of worship you are crying. That's why sometimes in the place of worship you are making sacrifice. It's a statement that everything that makes me relevant is yours. You open up yourself to God again so that the spirit man can give praise. In the heavens where the elders worship God, they did it by lying down and casting their crown. Their throne and their crown are the signatures of the authority in the heavens. But when worship begins, they cast all of those things away. These are technologies in the spirit. Did you not notice, those of you that sing, there are some chords you can never strike until you bend 
because that thing is deep you must have to stretch backward until it flows out of you it is a release of essence the release of glory as a sacrifice before the throne of God if you have not come to the point where your flesh is disarmed the will of God is revealed and the intimacy of the of, of the work of the spirit within you is activated your spirit can't worship God most of the things we call worship are exercise in the flesh that's why the lady is leading worship all she's trying to do is to turn her hair like this so that you see the long hair she made from the salon yesterday she is still conscious of everybody seeing the guy is on the altar worshiping he sacks his throat like this and then he's doing like this As he's, he's checking out the people who are admiring him and he says he's worshiping you don't know what you are doing when you worship you die everything flesh dies the first time a man worshipped God in the Bible was Genesis 22 verse 5. Abraham was giving up his only prized Joel. Priceless Joel. Isaac. He was going to offer Isaac. And in Genesis 22 verse 5 he said, wait at the foot of the mountain and we go and worship. Do you know how to climb the mountains? <laughs> it's not stones and bricks you hold to climb. It's surrender. You surrender. Everything that gives you value, you surrender because it's a statement of absolute trust that if my whole vulnerability is presented before God I'm still certain that he is the one that holds the key to my life and I will never be relevant until he speaks concerning me it's the way of relevance the journey to the mountain is a journey of relevance because it's a traffic into the presence of God but very few find it very few find it most of us are still full of ambition and then we come, we say God wants to use us to change the world. Which world? The world that is your taskmaster. They did not read in the Bible. Everybody God used to change the world. He first of all separate him from the world. Because the world that disciple you, you can't change it. He is your master. In Luke 1 8, he said the child John was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. If he is trained by the system, how can he correct the system? He's thinking like the system, he's talking like the system. His belief system is built by the system. So God separates you first. In Mark 3.14, he called them to be with him that he may send them. How do you change the world that is your disciple? You don't know why most times men of God are separated and isolated. It's not a show of pride. Because they know that if the world enters them, they can be contaminated. Nobody is immune to contamination. That's why we hide in the spirit. Jesus finished a crusade. He runs to the mountain. He ministers to people. He runs to the mountain. He wants to eat. He says, you people go and buy. He stays alone. You think he's uh, an act in the flesh. That's the only way to survive. Your soul has been opened on account of the fall. You guide it with all diligence. You guide it. It's the Holy Ghost that carries us. But we must master the way of yieldedness. The way of absolute surrender is the key into the mountains of God. Who shall ascend unto the mountains of God? Who shall stand upon his holy years? Him who has not lifted up his heart in vanity. Whose hand is pure? See men full of flesh talking about spiritual things. Because you heard Apostle Arumel say it, you think. Go and say the same thing now. I was in a meeting where Reverend Dr. Mark Pye was saying something. <laughs> oh boy, this man have seen things. A young man came and challenged him. Say what? Is it me you spoke to? Say, okay, look around you. Today is your last day. Just appreciate the word. Anything you want to see, see it now because you will not see it tomorrow again. <laughs> and then you go and say, God cannot kill. The guy was crossing the road. A trailer ran into him and plunged. Why? The man said, take a good look around you. You will not see this thing again. This is the last day you are seeing it. <laughs> it's God having power with God. It's the way of the mountain. You don't know the holy mountains, but get about authority. It's not for you. I don't pray and pursue power. What I strive to do every day is to be in the center of God's will. If my obedience is complete, I know I can avenge other disobedience. These are the wisdom that the fathers know. You are going, Lord, give me power. Lord, give me power. 
power to heal the sick, power to raise the dead. Meanwhile, when Adebo in his down, he say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then he comes out, and as he stands in the stadium like this, even if they say Adebo is coming, the whole stadium is packed without flyers. What is at work? He understands the dynamics of organic reality. You don't know. It. These men died. They died. Many times they cried. Some were crying. They said, Lord, don't show me mercy. Break me. Break me. Because I'm the greatest enemy of my future. I must come to a point where I completely learn the way of absolute reliance. Bishop Oedipo called it total abandonment. We believe it's about powerful words. So as you are coming for the meeting, you are charging. You talk, 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 talk. When you are talking, people are looking like this. You say, come and give your heart to Christ. Somebody is checking Facebook. Everything you have been saying for two hours. It didn't, even, it didn't. Meanwhile, Peter stood up and just told them the story that all of them knew. And the Bible said their hearts were pricked. This was the story they all knew. But their hearts were pricked. He spoke from the womb of the spirit. The system of the presence. I listened to Ben Him preach this message. I heard it again and again. I will go and lie down. Many years ago. And then yesterday, while we were coming from Ibenidium, the lady played it again. I said, What message is this? Send it to me. These were the things that made me. <laughs> These were the things that made me. When men are pursuing men and pursuing things, pursue the Holy Ghost. Stay with Him. It will be boring at first, but stay there. A time will come when it will become fascinating. Because someday you will go to stay and then light will come out from the wall. And then you look. Is there a door here? You will just wake up. And then as you woke up, you see an elder walk out of the wall. And then he's talking to you. And while he's talking, you wanted to answer. Then your spirit comes out of you and stands before him. And your spirit is talking to him, but you, 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 are, you are here. And you woke up the next day and you are full of wisdom. And then people say, oh, but which book you they read now? You say, okay, this is the books I read. Take. They'll go and read the whole book and become more foolish. <laughs> you journey, you, shall, you enter the city. You enter the city in Zion. Because this man died. The only thing that blocks you from entering God's presence is your flesh. But when it's completed, then you enter into the presence. It is the road map to the presence. The path of surrender. That's where flesh dies. That's where your ambition dies. Your pride dies. Some people come from it. I, yesterday I preached in a place where the crowd was heavy. But I'm not moved because we are not much. It's not about what you are thinking. Luke sat down and wrote the whole gospel of Luke and sent to one person. His name is called Theophilus. As if that was not enough, he sat down again and wrote the whole story of Acts of the Apostles and sent to the same person. Have you read the book of Luke and Acts before? Some people have never read it. Because it's a body. A man sat down and wrote the whole book to send to one person. <laughs> They understood the values that were in the mind of the father. The one person that God troubles you to pray for for six months. Others are going for crusade. Your friends are being known as apostles. So you go and open a Facebook page and put Apostle Victor. That page will be there for 10 years before you have three likes. <laughs> they are meeting, say, oh boy, I beg. Make I just give five minutes charge. When you are giving charge, that's when all the relevant people will not come. As you are dropping. Then somebody just walked in. And then the next person that comes and says, Glory to Jesus. Then they say, Please, can you come and minister in Lagos? Meanwhile, you were giving charge, talking to The man didn't come. The moment you dropped the mic, that was where the man came. And he was looking for a missionary in Africa. And your friend that just came and said, Yes, God is helping us. He said, Please come, let's go to the US. You go for another meeting. They finish preaching your message. You say, Let's put it on YouTube. You now put it on YouTube. And you even sponsored it on Instagram. And after three weeks, you come and check. There are two views. <laughs> In this kingdom, it's God that announces men. And it's only men that die that God announces. Because it is his life that makes the difference. When you are full of flesh, you are powered by another kind of life. It's the way of the presence. When you come into the presence, that's where I want to begin my message from. 
Oh, but I still have 30 minutes. Okay, I have 30 minutes. What happens in the present? What happens in the present? Everything you have been struggling to do in the flesh, that's what happens in the present. Stay the next person. You want to raise the dead, it's in the present. Everything you have been laboring to do in the flesh is what happens in the present. Hallelujah. You reign, you ancient iron skin. We cry out, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Break forth, O fountains of the deep, cry out, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You know, I love this song so much because every time I sing it, it reminds me that God is a king. <laughs> you know, what will make you relevant in eternity is not because God is your father. What will make you relevant in eternity is because God is a king. You know him as a king and as a judge. Because in the world to come is a kingdom. And sons are not rewarded. Sons are the heirs of that world. But reward is given to priests and kings. <laughs> Have you not noticed that your father will not give you the car to drive even though there are 10 cars in the house? You grow up first. When you begin to take responsibility, then your father gives you the whole wheel. That thing was yours when you were born. But it's when you grew up that it was wheeled to you. Those who know God as father, they can go and sin tomorrow and come back and say, Lord, have mercy. And God will forgive them. They will sin again and say, Jesus, have mercy. And Jesus will forgive them. They will fornicate and say, God! And God will forgive them. But in eternity, they will be babes wearing pampas. The kingdom is not for babes. The heir. So long as he's a child, different nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. I try to know him every day as a king and as a judge because I know as a judge he will just judge rightly. You will not be judged unto condemnation because the judgment of condemnation is on the cross. But whether you and I will be big in eternity depends on our works. Joshua Selman said something, the great apostle of Jesus. He said in Christ we are all equal. But it's our sacrifice that makes the difference. <laughs> Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion's king. Cry out, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You don't know how men become big. They are men of the presence. It's only men of the presence that are mighty in the kingdom. Bishop Oedipo is a lion. You see, we talk about revival and many things that God wants to do. The territories that we are still talking and making boast of in the north, it was men like Oedipo that conquered it. How many revival is going on in Sokoto and Medjugorje? Because the impact of his ministry was in, in Kaduna. These were the men that conquered those land because they were lions. Some years ago, he bought a land and the talks came saying nobody will enter the land. He said if anybody steps into that land, he will be struck with irrecoverable madness. The next day by 10 a.m., three people were already mad. They ran away. They, were, they are lions. Men like W.F. Kumuye stood up and he screamed an alarm of holiness. And in his days, when he rained and shined like the sun you couldn't even give a job to anybody those days they want to give job they look for deeper lifers you don't apply they trust them because a man understood the systems of holiness they are men of the mountain you think things just happen i sat 
returned that Apostle Rome, he spoke, and then all my lost died. He didn't do a Bible study, he only gave a charge. How can a man deposit God in you so much? You came as a liar, and suddenly you left. There's no discipline, everything dies. They are men of the presence. Reverend, please we walk towards a sick person and the cancer will go down. How is it possible? They are men of the presence. If Apostle Selma enters here now, he's a, mo he's a router. The man is a router. If he comes here now, there are many spiritual possibilities that will be happening on their own accord because Selma is around. You enter his meeting, things are happening even when he's not talking. They are men of the presence. It's not about the scriptures you know. People are joking, playing around with their lives. Can't push. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You reign, Shen Zion's king. We cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. I made up my mind that even if it's five minutes of my clip, you will hear, you will not sin again. Fire will engulf you. I, I will die to everything that is flesh. In my days, it will be heard that men fear the Lord. You will hear you can't. Every demon that holds you down will run away. There will be hunger, strange. You cannot explain it. Certainly, you will pray without ceasing. I don't know what you pursue, but me, I want to be popular among the immortals. I want to be popular in the region of Zion so that when I show up, I will walk in eternity like an immortal. I will not be a colossus on the earth. In eternity, they will call me a patriarch. Have dead and vain priorities. Men of the mountain. It's on the mountain that the will of God is apprehended. On the mountain. Hey. Hush. I wish I had time. God will not commit anything serious to your life until you can climb the holy mountains. Nothing serious can be committed to you. If you like, quote all the scriptures and talk big, motivate yourself. Motivational speaking cannot move you in this kingdom. In Luke chapter 9, verse 26 to 34, that was when the kingdom was handed over to Jesus. It was on the mountain. Say six days later, he carried Peter, James, and John, and they went there. As he prayed, the faction of his countenance was altered. They appeared before him, Moses and Elias, and they talked with him. What were they talking about? The death in Jerusalem. That was when the will of the Father was made known to him. That for you to fulfill the claims of divine justice, you must die. And where you will die is in Jerusalem. You will not die in Galilee. You will not die in Nazareth. It's in Jerusalem. And you will die the death of the cross. That was when the testament of the law and the testament of the prophet was handed over to the kingdom. Because he climbed the holy mountain. He stood there and he would not come down if it took 10 years. You run to prayer. But tell me, you think it's about time to apprehend the mind of God. What will God have you do? You follow people and think they will give definition to your destiny. Who told you men make men? The mind of God. Why was Moses so strong? This guy had brought him to deliver Egypt, Israel. He knew that Israel was supposed to be delivered. This is the time. But he didn't know how to go about it. He went killing the Egyptian. How many Egyptians will you kill in a lifetime? And even if you kill all the Egyptians, who told you God want them to live in Egypt? The destination was not Egypt. They brought him, drove him until he went to the backside of the mountain. The Bible said he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. That was where God showed up and began to give him the blueprint of his will for Israel. The strategy was to challenge Pharaoh. The empowerment was a rod in his hand. And the mandate was to take them to the promised land. There was no way he would have known it until he ascended the holy mountains. Some of you are aware of what God wants you to do. You are saying, yes, I think God, you will think all your life. You can never stumble on the strategy until you come to the mountain and hear the voice of God. Because the voice comes with the empowerment and it comes with the mandate. John said, the one that sent me, the same said unto me. The one that sent me. There is no mincing word about it. The same said unto me, upon whoever the spirit 
descend and rest he is the messiah he knew his mandate was to identify the messiah the strategy was baptism so he was not baptizing because he learned a new way he had it he had it he had it why because he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto israel he was there until the day so for him prayer is not an act you carry out and come back prayer is the life you are sentenced to until god leads you funny thing we do called christianity the will of the father it's on the mountains that the encounters of your destiny are many are trusting god to reveal things to them things are not revealed on land they are revealed in the spirit you can't have any encounter in this life walking in the flesh everybody that had an encounter with god had it in the spirit even at the worst moment of their life this guy had mastered the way of the spirit or that was the only way they lived john was sentenced from civilization to die frustration nothing was working you not even talk about family they had none at this time everything they were dead to everything but even in partners they say i was in the spirit on the last day that was when he was carried to heaven to show him all the dimensions of heaven there were things shown to john that the, the angel told him don't alter it when the seven voices spoke that one by reason of privilege he's the only man that know it in all eternity the encounters of your life they are on the mountains of god you don't journey to the mountain for gate your life will be a puzzle a stream of trial and error and you will end up an average person the greatest crisis of life is to know that you were born great but end up small every day you will weep that's why most people retire and they die after three days when they were young they knew they were going to rule the nation but they lived for 65 years and upon retirement they ended up as custom officers they ended up without impact they knew the impact they were supposed to carry out they didn't carry it out so every day they sit outside their life is full of regret they see the things they should have done they never did because they did not choose the way of surrender they are living on campus you think life ends on campus having fun and going for clubs and parties you are a being of the of the flesh the bible said a man in honor that knoweth not is like the beast of the field that perishes precious people that their lives are supposed to be vessels to give expression to dimensions of god precious ladies that their wombs are supposed to be gates through which kingdom and miseries are raised they go to waste their lives for temporary pleasure because we are not taught the way of the mountain that's where the difference of humankind lies the encounters of your destiny are on the mountain and life is a product of encounters the encounters you have are what will change you but if you don't know the way of the mountain you will never have encounters you will live by the stories men tell you a preacher comes to them because you gave a very sound charge he calls you and say you are an apostle <laughs> hallelujah glory to the lamb glory to the father you are seated on the throne hallelujah glory to the lamb Glory to the Father, you are seated on the throne. The empowerment for your destiny is on the mountain of God. Moses went to the mountain and the rod he carried became the rod of God. Something came upon the rod. Some of you, what will make you is your mind, but your mind needs to be energized on the mountain. Some of you, what will make you is your tongue. Your tongue needs to be energized on the mountain. Some of you, what will make you is your skill. You need to be energized on the mountain the mountain is where men are empowered for destiny even in the negative supernatural they know the guy who has the business next shop is not the pure water that makes him a millionaire he knows the spirit that breathes upon it it's only christians that think life is a function of chance so they are doing trial and error every day you are a funny creature the people of the world will defeat you in everything you do because you don't know your advantage the guy knows his advantage is in the navy and every December he must go to Newi with the requisite sacrifice. You, you are there talking. Say, God, we show mercy. Ah, God, love me. I'm the child of God. The mountains. The mountains. The cities that swallows people's destinies, they are conquered with the resources from the mountain. Aye. 
I did a teaching on technology of spirit civilization. I wish I had time to share some things with you. See, the city you live in have the ability to rob you of your destiny. Many people in the east today, they have the love of money. Not because they were born that way. The day the city was built, that intelligence was wired into the foundation. So even if you come to church, it will not help until you find the presence. The children of Israel were being carried to the land flowing with milk and honey. They saw the pillar of cloud every day and the pillar of fire. They were walking with a mobile miracle, but it didn't change their lives. They wanted to go to Egypt and eat garlic and cucumber. Because cities have the ability of brainwashing you and making you a slave forever. Even if you see miracles every day, it will not change anything. Do you know what it means? When three million people are walking and a cloud from heaven is moving ahead of them. And at night that cloud becomes fire for 40 years. It didn't change their minds. Because Egypt had educated them. It's a technology called the technology of speedy cities. It enslaves men. But the cure is what you receive from the mountain. There's a city in the spirit called Egypt. Egypt will keep you in the world forever. Egypt will never allow you go. Because in Egypt there is Pharaoh. It is Pharaoh that makes your talent useless. It's Pharaoh that makes a king a servant. And he will slave with your talent. Nobody will know you are there. It's a system called Egypt. Egypt will keep you a perpetual sinner forever. You can't move. If you want to move, the gods of Egypt will fight you. You make resolutions every year. I want to serve the Lord. If Egypt is not dealt with, you can't. It's a system that keeps people in the world. But the cure to Egypt is the rod and the blood. The rod is the word of God. And the blood is the perfect atoning sacrifice of Jesus. That's what delivers men from Egypt. And all of these things are in the presence. The rod of Moses is in the ark. And the blood is what you pour on the ark. When you come to the presence, you have access to the rod and the blood. It begins to speak for you so that the powers of Egypt can't fight you anymore. That's why in First John 1 9, he says, If we walk in the light as it is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. If you are in the presence, the blood of Jesus walks. He walks. And Pharaoh will let you go on his own. You don't know why most of you live in sin. You try. You can't. It's not trying. You don't try. When you come to spirit, you don't try. You either yield or you rebel. And your safety depends on the one you yield to. Because if he's superior in rank, then you are safe. If you, <laughs> if you yield to Satan, you will perpetually born in hell. Because God is superior in rank. But if you yield to God, Satan is in trouble. When you leave Egypt, you think you are going. Then Jericho stands before you. Jericho is a city that does not allow anything to come out or going. It blocks your way from destiny. You don't know why you are born again, but you can't get married. Ha. There are four of you in your house. One is 38. One is 35. One is 33. One is 31. All of you are queens. Nobody is asking for your hand in marriage. Even the, wo- the boys that you bought phone for, when they collected the phone, they ran away. You have a degree. You have done your master's. You have done PhD. No job. Ha. They were okay. It's okay. You just humble yourself and do a small job. You go, they say you have a qualified. It's Jericho. If you deal with Jericho, even if you carry pure water, you'll be a millionaire. It's a city. And what deals with the city is the trumpet of the priest. The trumpet. The Holy Ghost tells you what to do. And when you blast it, the city sinks. The trumpet in our dispensation is the prophecy. And the Bible said the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Ghost puts that word in your mouth and you utter it. I tell you things I have experience of. My sisters, three of them, 34 years, 32 years, two of them, not married. Until God told me you are a priest. And he said, go and blow your trumpet. I went to them, I said, you are hereby dismissed from this house. Get married. In six months, three of them got married. They are living with their children now. It's a city. 
but if you don't know how to stand on the mountain you will be buried in that city buried the way most of them were buried in the wilderness you will be buried and then even when you enter into the promised land babylon can come and carry you like this and take you out they are cities <laughs> babylon babylon does not prevent you from entering the promised land he allows you to enter first when you settle down and say now i'm blessed then he will come and carry you back to slavery and bondage what deals with babylon is consecration prayer and fasting because to deal with babylon babylon is governed by principalities to deal with babylon you need to interact with angels because only princes can fight princes that's when archangels are mobilized on your account but for that thing to happen in the spirit you must be on the altar perpetually daniel and his friends they say they will not be defied by the king's meat it's not enough that you are excellent too. the bible said they were 10 times better than their peers but they were still in what babylon you can graduate with first class but there's no prosperity you are in babylon but by consecration and yieldedness to god in prayer and fasting then the spirit realm the powers of the spirit realm begins to move in your favor that's when the force of babylon breaks they can even make you a king in babylon first class then you become first class you become the president of all the unemployed and the government is giving you people stipend ten ten thousand because you are first class and you are intelligent you'll be the one speaking on their behalf <laughs> babylon the cure to the affliction of humankind is the presence of jesus some think it's prayer it's not prayer some think it's fasting it's not fasting is the presence of jesus so if prayer doesn't take you to the presence it's a waste fasting doesn't take you to the presence it's a waste when you know this your pride about spirituality will die you will learn to yield to the holy spirit that's why every morning we come and ask for help have you not noticed that most prayer warriors are gallant failures you take pride in the things you do no latch onto the holy ghost and let not go of the holy spirit until he does something to your life that's when your secret sins can fall the crisis of your life can fall and if you don't know the way of the presence many lives and destinies that are tied to you will be maligned because in this world we have space we have place the place god has given you anybody who is within the perimeter of that place his destiny is tied to you that was why when balaam fell he became the way of balaam many prophets now fall to the same iniquity of lost over money or lost over women is the way of balaam he said to peter he said simon simon satan desires to have you to sift you like with he said but i have prayed for you that your faith faileth not when thou art recovered strengthen thy brethren why because when peter becomes weak the brethren becomes weak they are within the ambience and perimeter of his place some of you you are the deliverer of your family but the more you continue in your iniquities and disalignment with the holy spirit the more your family will remain in bondage you are running and inviting prophets from far and wide god is waiting for you to rise i told them in the benedium i said deliverance is not a function of the intervention of god it's a function of the rise of priests because god has paid the price kadosh kadosh you are mighty on your throne you reign you ancient zion's king Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. See, my time is up. But you can rise now and pray. Ask the Lord to help you. You ancient Zion's king, cry out, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Break forth. Thou fountains of the deep cry out, Adosh, you are mighty on your throne. 
you want to make up your mind this morning and say lord i choose the way of surrender come forward let me pray with you quickly i'm not going to minister in the spirit because the next minister is here there's no point causing a disarray you just want to make up your mind you've been a christian but you say i want to surrender completely to your will to your government just place your hand on your chest you don't need to come forward let's not let's not disalign or distort the place and make that commitment to jesus make that commitment now make that commitment you are mighty on your throne this morning and you are genuine about it just lift your hands and ask the Lord to touch you tell him you want an experience yes you know a lot of doctrine you have name among men you have titles but perhaps you are not popular among the immortals you want an experiential work with God you have struggled for too long now you need the help of the Holy Ghost Tell him to minister to you now. Let Jesus reign in your life. Ah, God, you reign. Yes, you reign. Jesus, you reign. Yes, you reign. Ah, God, you reign. Jesus, you Yes,
is a time to make decisions for Jesus. You can stop praying now. You can stop praying now. Just place your hand on your chest. I want to ask the Holy Ghost to minister to some people. Some of you, the Holy Ghost will just reveal things to you. Some of you, the Holy Ghost, you may just feel him tangibly. I don't want us to push so much this morning. It's more of a teaching series. Precious Holy Spirit. Stop praying now. Stop praying. Only the keyboard is enough for me. Just play the keyboard very low. Just focus on the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we bring too much religion into these things. Holy Spirit, look upon our hearts. And as many as are making this decision for you this morning, stretch your hands and touch them. Anoint them. Quicken them. Inspire them. Strengthen them. Right now, Holy Spirit, just breathe upon us like a gentle wind to help us to stand. Faithful Father, just focus on the Holy Ghost. God is going to be helping your decision to be eternal. Putting strength on you. Holy Spirit. This is the time. Touch now. Like a gentle wind. Like a gentle wind. Like a very gentle wind. Minister to their hearts, Lord. Minister to their hearts. Just minister to their hearts, Lord. They are yielded vessels. Some of you are called. Some of you have been receiving instructions, but the ability to obey is not there. This is the time. Just, just, just quietly, just quietly. You don't need to struggle. Just open to the Holy Spirit and allow Him. And allow Him. I don't want to push it. I want it to be an exper- experience, an experience of God. An experience of God. Some of you, he'll be prompting you to make decisions. Decisions. It's a hard business this morning. Decisions you've not made before. Decisions you've been struggling with. Just calm where you are. They make those decisions to God now. Decisions. To be a vessel in his hands perpetually. That's right. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now the Lord is going to be empowering, bringing empowerment to some of you. Some of you, your heart will become heavy. Some of you, your hand will begin to burn. Because it's time for empowerment. And so, dear Spirit of the living God, put the garment of empowerment on them now. You see, on the mountain, men shall be strengthened. Men shall be equipped. For their calling, for their ordination, for their destinies. Empower them, Lord. Empower them. Put the weight of glory on them. Put the weight of glory. Let it be an inner surgery, deep within, deep within. Weight of glory. Weight of glory. Weight of glory. Weight of glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Some of you, your hearts will be breaking now. You'll be weeping in compassion. You will realize, you will realize how far you have wandered. It's an inner operation. Just focus on Jesus now. Just focus. Just focus. Don't be distracted. That's right. You are weeping. Just just flow. Allow the Holy Spirit. It's an inner operation. It's an inner operation. It's an inner operation. You know, sometimes we church gets too noisy that we we don't let God do what He wants to do. It's an inner operation. Okay, stop playing the keyboard now so we don't get so emotional. Let's keep it calm so that people keep making decisions. It's an inner operation. Just focus on Jesus. Focus. Focus. It's more of an inner operation. 
Come, come. Let's keep it very calm and quiet. Come, come and hold her. It's an inner operation. Just focus, focus. Those of you that your faith needs to be helped. It's an inner operation. Make decisions. Make decisions. You mustn't feel. You mustn't feel. Just make decisions continually. If you need to reiterate it, go ahead. It's an inner operation. Very quietly. Let's not get emotional about it. Just quietly. Those who need to be helped, we'll just help them quickly. It's an inner operation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just gently, just be talking to God. Talk to Him. Just talk to Him from the depths of your heart. Make decisions. Great meetings are meetings where great decisions are made. It's an inner operation. Just keep, keep calm. Ushers, if you can help them to stay calm. Thank you, Lord. Sister that is weeping profusely. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We've lived lawlessly for too, much, for too long. And then we come to church, we shout in tongues. And we think it's about shouting. Meanwhile, our life is, is far from God. Talk to Jesus. Hey, help me. It's an inner operation. Deep within, deep within, ask God to touch you, minister to you, and make decisions for him. It's the decisions you make that will determine your relevance in the kingdom. And it, the direction of your commitment is the direction of your decision. You don't make decisions for God. Your life will have no definite direction. What we are doing this morning, we are redirecting the paths of our destinies. We are redirecting. We are redirecting the paths of our destiny. Most of us have very great destinies, but we will never realize them because we are not taught how to yield our lives to God perpetually. Life is a function of the progressive instructions of the Holy Spirit that you consistently obey. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Finally, somebody is about to be set on fire. One person is about to be set on fire for Jesus now. It's an evangelical flare. I just sense it in the Spirit. And so, precious Holy Spirit, put that fire on that one as we end the meeting. Put that fire on that one as we end the meeting. Put that fire on that one. That one you are anointing. That one you are anointing. That one you are anointing. Help him so that the chair doesn't. Thank you, Lord. Thank I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.